you're listening. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Lots coming up on the show this morning. Uh, allow me to go off on a slight tangent before we've even started. I- I've discovered today that a member of the uh, breakfast team has spent over £100 on a pair of gloves. A pair of gloves, can you imagine? Over £100. It was 115 On a pair of gloves. I'm not going to say who. I wouldn't want to embarrass them. But I don't think I own any piece of clothing that comes even close to that. Can we, can we just try and find, just to, you know, can we try and find the most expensive piece of clothing that a listener owns this morning? Just a slight tangent I'm going to throw out there. 08459 455 555. Slightly more important matters coming up this morning. Lord Leveson is to publish his report into the culture practice, uh, culture, practice and ethics of the press. How far should journalists be able to go to report stories? An incredible story that you just heard uh, in the news there with Catherine. A woman who's had five heart attacks was turned away from a hospital in Wickham and told to go back into the car park and phone an ambulance. Do you feel like your local hospital cares for you? And the author of Fifty Shades of Grey has given her first TV interview since the book was published. Have you read it? Guess what? I haven't. What's the fuss all about? Uh, And if you haven't read it... Don't worry, we're going to have audio, uh, audio bits of it. Some, a member of my team, Paul Scoynes, the political reporter, has read some of the slightly less mucky bits. So don't, it, it's suitable for young ears, don't worry. We won't do anything too X-rated, but it's, you know, be warned. Uh, you can get in touch via uh, texting 81333, starting your text 3CR. Uh, you can go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR or, and this is the best way to get in touch, you can give us a call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. I'll say it again though. £115 on a pair of gloves. They're just gloves. Gloves are like. I think gloves are five ninety nine, aren't they? I don't think I'd, I've never paid more than ten pounds for gloves. Can we find the most expensive item of clothing that you own, please? Oh, eight four five nine four double five five double five. Now, after a hundred days of hearings, hundreds of witnesses, and thousands of pages of evidence, the Leveson inquiry will report later on today. It's been looking into the culture, practice, and ethics of the press, and particularly how the industry should be regulated. Among the controversial issues it's looked at are phone hacking and the close relations between the press, senior politicians and the police. Whatever the conclusions, it's clear the report will have huge implications for journalists. Well, joining me in the studio is a lecturer in journalism at the University of Bedfordshire, Kate Ironside. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Ian. Uh, the, the, The inquiry's been going on... Forever, it feels like. It's just constantly been in the background. Are we fe- we're feeling the effects of it already, to a certain extent, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. I think it kicked in uh, from the very moment uh, that David Cameron ordered the Eleverson Inquiry. Suddenly, uh, the newspaper industry realised it really was in deep trouble that the Press Complaints Commission, which had been really a rather cosy arrangement, now was up a gum tree. It had plainly not worked. This was the body, the self-regulatory body, that was supposed to keep an eye over the newspapers. When the uh, evidence started emerging of phone hacking, it wrote to News International, said, excuse me, are you phone hacking? And News International wrote back and said, no, we're not. And they said, "Ah, that's all right then. (laughs) That'll do. They said no, so it must be true. Ethics and journalism... Don't really go hand in hand. We like to think. Oh, of, but they do, Ian. No, they, no, they do. Really. They've got to. They absolutely. We like to got think it's to. all like all the president's men, and it's these these tough nosed journalists that are really, you know, trying to. But, but really, you, well, you well, you have two. Com- uh, two conflicting factors, don't you? Uh, Much of journalism is a business. Mm. And to survive, it has to make money and it has to sell what the public is interested in. And you look at a raft of all those celebrity magazines, Mm. uh, the way in which the tabloid newspapers outsell the broadsheet newspapers. We've seen the owner of The Independent today is looking to sell at least a slice of it because The Independent uh, cannot make enough money. It's losing money hand over fist. Whereas, should we say, the unethical end of the market mm. uh, is selling, um, bringing in the in the readers. Um, it is a challenge. It certainly is. And yet it is so important for society to have a proper ethical form of journalism that is holding those with power to account in some form. Mm. It is absolutely vital. But the, the real world gets in the way sometimes, doesn't it? And, and journalists are going to be tempted 
to overstep the mark of what they're allowed to do, won't they? If, if, if it means they could get some information, then surely they'll be tempted to... I think most naughty. journalists have no wish to be unethical. You can find uh, individuals under huge pressure because of circulation wars, because of pressure from proprietors. Uh, but most journalists just wish to do an ethical job. Do they really? I think it, so. Cause yes, cause I think they do. They don't wake up in the morning and say, let's go and uh, invade the privacy and so on. But what you also need yeah. to remember, Ian, yeah. is the scale of yeah. control that is coming from the other side. All the focus has been on the unethical behaviour of journalists. Just look at the behaviour of celebrities. Okay, you on. want an interview with a celebrity. Yep. Uh, most of the big names are controlled by a relatively small hand, handful of agents and publicists. Yes. They will set the rules of engagement. You will interview the celebrity on this date, yeah. here, in this location. The celebrity will be wearing these clothes. You will not ask the celebrity questions on X, oh, Y, I've and Z. Oh, I've done those interviews, yes, with a list Absolutely. of things you're not allowed to ask. Uh, uh, the, uh, they will want to see uh, your article in, in advance before they are published, yep. uh, and they will take out anything they don't like, and they want to have uh, the photographs done in a certain way, and if they don't like it, when you are faced with that level yes. of control, yeah. is it any wonder... That journalist sit back and think, well, hang on, what is the real story about this individual who is making a huge amount of money? It doesn't out of justify their image? them hacking their phones, though, does it? I wouldn't say so, no. But you have to bear in mind that is the level of control coming from the other side. It's, it's not just celebrities, you get it from the politicians as well. I will come on and do this interview. I won't come on live. I won't come on if you're going to put me up against my main uh, political rival. Yep. I won't answer questions on this and that. Now, robust, challenging journalists will. But it is very, very different, difficult if you know that if you upset them, mm. they are going to turn around and say, right, no more interviews. You've messed up interview with this celebrity, so I will not facilitate you interviewing any other celebrity. That's very, very hard when your market depends on you being able to sell newspapers, yep. magazines, uh, whatever, to people because they are interested in celebrities. I had my phone hacked years ago. I used to be on telly years ago. Oh, bless. I had, I had it hacked. It's not very nice. No, it isn't very nice. Not at all. It's, it, it's not a nice world, and people shouldn't do it unless there is a clear public interest. Finally, will the, will the public... How will the public be affected by this inquiry? I think the key, the key issue is what sort of uh, press industry are we going to have? Mm. And actually, to be honest, I don't think the issue is with Leveson. I think the issue is, can the printed media survive in a competitive form? At the moment, where does the public prefer to get its news from? Online. It's all for there, for free. How do you make money? Uh, this is the great question, monetising online think this content. this is the far, far the greater challenge uh, for newspapers and magazines, is how do you compete with a free online market? Kate, thank you very much for coming in. It's fascinating stuff. The, the, the report comes out, do we know what time it, it's made public today? Um, well, Leveson is speaking at one thirty. Right. Uh, very, very briefly, and he's not taking any questions, mm. and then he's flying off to Australia. <laughs> All right for some. Good for him. Kate, thank you very much indeed. Morning, Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Lots coming up on the show this morning. The, the, the key thing I want to focus on, we're talking about bad customer service later on. There's a fantastic story in the newspapers. Not fantastic, but it made us chuckle because it didn't happen to us. We'll, we'll do that later on. Can we beat £115 uh, a, a pair of gloves? I, I don't own anything. Even my poshest, poshest shoes I once owned were nowhere near £100. What's the most expensive piece of clothing that you own, dear listener? Can we beat 115 quid? Seriously, 115 £115 for a pair of gloves. Gloves are like five ninety nine, aren't they? This, this story is incredible. An investigation is underway after a woman with a history of heart attacks was turned away from Wickham Hospital while suffering from palpitations. The nurse is told Becky Evans Woodward uh, to get back into the car park and phone an ambulance because it was the only way she was going to be admitted. Well, later on in the show, Becky's husband, Alvin, is going to be joining me. On the line now is the MP for Wickham, Steve Baker. Morning, Steve. Good morning. Well, what What happened? Well, it's appalling, isn't it? It appears that what happened is yet another example of what the Secretary of State called yesterday, ticking the box but missing the point. What I've been told is that um, Becky Evans Woodward was driven by her husband to Wickham Hospital's cardiology unit um, with, uh, with palpitations, very frightened. 
the cardiology unit turned her away. She has a history of heart attacks as well. Yeah, That's... A- apparently, yes. She had a heart attack at uh, Stoke Mandeville at the age of 29, followed up by a further four, uh, which they couldn't stabilise. And, of course, the couple were extremely frightened that this was happening again. And Wickham's cardiology unit had treated them in the past. So I think... They were trying to do the sensible thing. He was just carefully taking her to the hospital, as you or I might, um, and are expecting them to, to, to treat them. Now, I can understand that we don't expect specialist units to, to just accept walking patients in the evening because you can't have every unit being an A&E. But, I, you know, there, there's, there's rules and then there's common sense. And I would have liked to have believed in this case they would have just opened the door. But what they did was send her over to the minor injuries unit for an ECG, which they couldn't do. So they referred her to Stoke Mandeville's A&E. Well, of course, they refused to go to the A&E at Stoke Mandeville just to be sent back to cardiology. So there was a debate, and they were sent outside to call an ambulance, which duly arrived and took them into the unit. But what a terrible, appalling palaver. So, Steve, was there, sorry, was there the ridiculous thing of them standing in, in, in the car park of the hospital, dialing 999, an ambulance came to the car park... They jumped in the back, then went round the corner. Well, so I understand. Uh, so I, I'm not sure they necessarily had to jump. Well, they might have jumped into... Uh, I'm not sure they were driven anywhere. They might right. have just stood at the main uh, emergency entrance to the hospital. But, yeah, th- this is the sort of appalling bureaucracy and the prioritisation of bureaucracy over common care. So, you know, I'm absolutely shocked and astonished. Um, I understand an apology has been issued by the hospital. It's such an ov- obviously appalling incident that... There has been an apology. Have you spoken to the hospital, Steve? Have they said anything to you? Um, I I have spoken to uh, some of the staff. I'm going along to the hospital on Friday where I know we're going to have further conversations. I raised it in the House of Commons yesterday. Um, One member of staff did use the word outrageous privately, but I'm not going to name them. Mm. Um, But, you know, people do know that it's just not good enough to to have turned this lady away not once but twice. Um, and to have, for somebody to have been prepared to send her up to Stoke Mandeville to come back just because they couldn't perform an ECG, well, it, it's obviously it, just wrong. It, we, we asked the hospital to come on, and they've not given us a response yet, but it, it, is, have you heard of any other incidents uh, of this happening um, in Wickham since the emergency medical centre was downgraded to the minor injuries unit? Well, I, I've only heard rumours... Um, so I wouldn't want to necessarily repeat rumours, but I would invite people who have been turned away to let me know. Uh, they can do that by uh, calling 01494 448 408. Mm. If they let me know, I'll gladly uh, pick it up. But bear in mind on this case, it wasn't about the, this actually wasn't about the downgrade of the MIU so much as just failing to use the service which is there. Mm. So it's a, it's a slightly different problem. But, uh, of course, you're right. During the consultation, we were reassured that it was all about better health care in Buckinghamshire. Um, I said people had to have a door through which they could go, after which they'd be rooted to good care. That hasn't happened in this case. They've got to sort it out. Steve, so you say you've raised this with the Health Secretary. What, what, what happens next? Where will that go now? Well, he made a speech yesterday um, saying that patients were experiencing contempt and cruelty in the NHS, and it was really quite an, a, a surprising speech. But um, he made this point that people are ticking the box but missing the point. He said that in places that should be devoted to patients where compassion should be uppermost, we find its very opposite, coldness, resentment and indifference, even contempt. So the, the Secretary of State is taking strong action right across the health service to try to sort this problem out. But I think we do have to remember there are excellent staff in the health service working very hard to do a good job. We need to be asking why the institution as a whole has managed to squeeze uh, uh, compassion and just simple human care out of people who must have gone into their profession well, Steve, to look after people. Thank you very much. Later on in the show, uh, Alvin, Becky's husband, is going to join us. Steve, just quickly before you, before you go, uh, the, the Leveson report, it's out today. Yeah. Uh, you signed a letter, didn't you, to the Telegraph saying there should not be government legislation. Uh, wh- why, do you, why do you think that's the right way to go? Well, because a free press, subject to the law, you know, they must behave lawfully, but a free press is a really important defender of the public against an over, over powerful government. Ha- so, yeah. Hasn't the press proved, though, that it's not capable of policing itself. But do you know what? Everybody's proved, if you look at people as a whole, everybody's proved over thousands of years that they can't police themselves. That's why we have laws and the police force and courts. Uh, But what we don't do with the public is set in place um, 
regulators to supervise people's lives, and I think it should be with the press. Steve, Thanks. listen, we've got to end it there. Thank you very much for that. Steve Baker, uh, who is uh, the MP for Wickham. Um, yeah, we're going to speak to uh, Becky's husband, Alvin, a little bit later on in the show. It's an incredible story, isn't it? If you have any experience, particularly with that hospital, I suppose, but any experience of um, being turned away from a hospital, 08459 455 555. We're going to talk... Th- th- this kind of ties in, I guess, because in the, the, the new the new world, we're, we're customers, aren't we, at hospitals? It's, and we're customers of the police. It's a police... Um, service, not a police force. We're customers. So we're looking at bad customer service today because there's a, in the, a couple of the papers, it's in the Telegraph and I think the Mail. Tourist who complained received a four-letter email reply. A tourist who complained about conditions on a trip to Mexico received expletive-laden emails from a holiday firm uh, employee calling her a moaning B-I-T-C-H. We could probably say that word, but it did. we've got young ears, and I'm, you know, always are on the side of caution. Gemma Fish visited the country on a £3,000 Thompson holiday with her partner for a Valentine's break this year. Shortly after arriving, she complained to the holiday firm by email she was unhappy with the standard of the hotel. In reply, Ms Fish received a series of abusive emails. Don't worry, I'll, I'll bleep myself here. One told her to shut the bleep up and said that Thompson did not want, want her custom. They then suggested she use rival company Thomas Cook. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? You, you, I mean, that's amazing. To get uh, emails and, and uh, on the phone. I once had to order, don't ask why, a custom-made cardboard box. <sighs> it's a long, boring story. So I went to this company to do it. And they never, I needed it by a specific date, and they didn't send it to me. I phoned up to complain, and I spoke to the manager. And then the next day I phoned up, and I spoke to him again, but he pretended he wasn't the manager. He said, oh, no, Mr Johnson isn't here. I said, you're, you're the fella I was talking to yesterday. No, no, I'm not, mate. And he pretended to be someone else. And then I phoned up the next day and spoke to his secretary, and she was in tears. She said he was a bully. Bad customer service. We hate it, but we kind of love it as well a bit in this country, don't we? What's the word? Without mentioning any company names or businesses, as JVS would uh, say, the worst customer service you've ever had. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Yes. uh, In the next half an hour, if you've got young ears, maybe you want to send them to go and make their breakfast or pack their lunch or do something. It's going, to get, it's going to get a little bit fruity in the next 30 minutes. E.L. James, the author of Fifty Shades of Grey, has given her first TV interview since the book was published. In the next few minutes, you'll be able to hear our political reporter, Paul Scoynes, read an extract from it. And I want to hear from you this morning. Have you read it? How was it for you? And it's freezing outside, isn't it? The Gritters have been out in force tonight, uh, last night. We'll find out how our councils are preparing... For the bad weather. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give me a call. This Fifty Shades of Grey, any good? Really? I think it's a girl's thing, isn't it? I don't think it's going to work on me. We'll find out in a bit when Paul Scoynes reads some. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Not, I'm, I'm not saying oh dear, oh dear to Beverly Knight. I like a bit of Beverly Knight. Oh, but I've, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about this next, uh, this next item. Ladies, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> well, then we'll begin. When it comes to erotic fiction, does it get any more erotic than this? The surge of jealousy I felt only moments ago tells me that I have deeper feelings for him than I had admitted to myself. Wednesday, he confirms, and he leans forward and kisses me softly. Something changes while he's kissing me. His lips grow more urgent against mine. His hand moves up from my chin, and he's holding the side of my head, his other hand on the other side. His breathing accelerates. He deepens the kiss. That's an extract from Paul Scoyne's own personal diary. It's not. (laughs) It's not. It's our political reporter, Paul Scoyne's, reading an extract from the book Fifty Shades of Grey. And I'll be honest... He wasn't very keen to do it. He was, sent, he was sent even ruder bits to read. That was the bit he chose to read. And I noticed a slightly sarcastic tone in his voice. The author behind the book, E.L. James, has uh, only, she's only just given her first TV interview. Well, erotic fiction is proving to be very popular here in the three counties. A month-long celebration of these disgusting books is taking place at Luton Library. It's called Between the Sheets. Fiona Marriott is head libra- uh, librarian at Luton Library. She's in the studio with me now. Good morning, Fiona. Good morning. Now, we've been having a giggle because you've brought a couple of books in. <laughs> 
Britain, <laughs> including a book by Portia da Costa called In Too Deep. Uh, and they do, they open, they fall open at the mucky pages. It's fallen <laughs> open at page 144. And I can't read it. <laughs> I cannot... There's a universe of difference between looking at... I can't read it, honestly. It's like proper... It, it's proper rude words. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> and there's another... Again, again, it just opens here. Page 122. My... I, the, the second word I can't read. It's a very <laughs> rude word for... I, I can't even allude to it. I didn't even know one of those existed, but apparently it does, and that woman knows what to do with it. So... <laughs> The, the erotic fiction, a, a new phenomenon? No, it's ancient, actually. Um, one of the first novels that we've got in the collection is from 1748. Wow. And it's a book that a lot of people will actually recognise called Fanny Hill. They may have found okay. it by dad or mum's bedside when they were children, and the book would be whisked off them before they could actually read it. This is written in 1748. They didn't have sex in 1748, Oh, did they? yes, they did. And actually, they were much more free and easy about it than we are today I think when the Victorians came along they repressed an awful lot of stuff but before that everybody was kind of relaxed about sex and people didn't even get married until they had children he's reading sorry I am <laughs> <laughs> I am reading it it is um Oh, I mean, this is from 1748. It's absolutely filthy. There's an interesting story behind this, wasn't there? It was written in a debtor's prison or something. It was, and I think it was written in order to actually pay for him to get out of the debtor's prison. Unfortunately, as soon as he came out of prison, he was arrested for writing the book. Good. So it didn't actually work that well. But it is a classic. It's been around uh, in one form or another for centuries. Now, this book, we're, we're, Portia da Costa, In Too Deep. Yes. <laughs> now, listen, you, you're, you're a young librarian. The, the premise of this story is, when young librarian Gwendolyn Price finds increasingly erotic love notes to her in the suggestion box at work, she finds them both shocking and liberating. Now, if you, Fiona, received erotic notes in your inbox at work, <laughs> would you do what she does or would you go and call the police? I think I'd call the police. I'd be really worried. But it's a story, isn't it? Um, I kind of read through that last night, just had a quick flick through, and I just kept thinking, oh, no, no. <laughs> but I think it's because it's a bit too close to home. And the other bizarre thing is yes. one of my middle names is Gwendolyn. Oh, <laughs> I see. So what, what is this Between the Sheets mucky it's, month you're having? <laughs> mucky month. <laughs> Between the Sheets is a, a national pro promotion put together by Stella Libraries, which is a collective of libraries that put together promotions each year. Mm. Last year we did banned books, which were books that had been banned across the world. And this is kind of a step further. When we were approached to say, did we want to take part, there was a kind of pause before we said yes. And then we thought, you know what, go for it. Mm. Because Fifty Shades of Grey has kind of opened up the conversation. Mm, it's opened up something, yes. <laughs> but to be honest, most of the books in our collection were actually there anyway and people were actually borrowing them anyway um, you've got things in there like Jilly Cooper and Shelley Conran which again classics from the 80s is Jilly Cooper mucky? Oh, yes. Oh, is, it, is, it, is <laughs> yes. she filth? Yes, there's a book called Riders, yes. which was, I think, made into a TV series, which was very rude. Right. And so, um, Jackie Collins as well, she's... Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> Most of my education came from Jackie Collins. <laughs> really? Yes, my mum left the book lying around and didn't seem to mind me reading it when I was about 12 or 13. Oh, gosh. And that was a bit of a surprise. Why? Because Fifty Shades of Grey has, has, has kind of reignited this whole thing again. Yes. But I, I know from various people uh, that, that some people don't, don't think it's a particularly good example of this form no, of literature. No, I mean, I have to say the general consensus is that it's not terribly well written. It takes 100 pages to get to the good stuff, it doesn't does, it? It does, yes. As the, the one you've got in front of you is page two. In so too deep, goes straight faster. in there, does it? <laughs> yep, yep. But I think there is some good fiction out there. I think what we've tried to choose are books that are actually quite well written. And you've still got to actually identify with the character you still have to like the person or find them interesting otherwise it's just not that interesting to read after page two and he's reading it, again it does, it does go <laughs> in too deep seriously can i borrow this <laughs> I, I i can't read i keep going to read it and i can't because i've only had this job a few months and i, I would love i would love to keep it <laughs> um do, do you, when, when people come and take these books out and i'm guessing it's mainly women isn't it I, I would say that most of the readers are women but i suspect there are some men as well because men uh, like the visuals, don't mm -hmm. they? That's why they, mucky mags do quite so well yes. for men, and they don't really do well for women. And, and women go for books. Do, 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 but 
who who is ta- who is taking these books out? What what's the average kind of person that's coming and getting these? Now that's one thing we don't know because one of the pluses for the readers is they can use our self issue machines. Oh, so I see. So they don't actually have to come and speak to anybody to take the books out, and I think that's good because it means no one's actually feeling embarrassed about taking anything out from the library. But to be honest, every book is out on loan at the moment. The two <laughs> I've got there were the only two left. That's incredible. So people will need to reserve them, which they can do online. Again, they don't have to come and ask if they're embarrassed. How is the library doing? I'm a big fan of libraries. Is it doing okay? It is, yes. We're busy as always. And I have to say, in times where money is really tight, people do come to the library for help with things like doing CVs, Mm. um, help finding jobs. Um, We've also got Mind in the central library now twice a week. And they're seeing lots of people with mental health issues. We had them in talking about that, yeah. Yeah, you know, partially as a result of unemployment and unemployment can lead to divorce and so on so the library's there for that that kind of first stop shop i love libraries i've got two little boys three and one and we're always at the library when did they change the rule because when i was a kid you had to be really quiet in the library shh, shh. <laughs> now anything goes in the library you can do anything in there yeah i would say about 20 Jeez. years ago so it's obviously a while since you've been it was. <laughs> I, I used to get kicked out of the library for being too noisy when i was a kid I now they run around making as much noise as they want i have to say i've been told by customers to be quiet a few times good good well listen thank you so much uh fiona mary if, and if people th- th- is this mucky month keep calling it a mucky month sorry <laughs> between the sheets this is on now so if people want to go and it is and can i just say it's yes. also on facebook and twitter so you can actually tweet the sheets oh which dear. is the, the twitter tag phrase. <laughs> but you can actually take part in the conversation Brilliant. on our facebook page which is luton libraries thank you so much for coming in take that filth <laughs> with you i don't want anything more to do with that Right, we'll have some more of uh, Paul Scoyne's reading Fifty Shades later on. Well, look at look at this. We throw out all these uh, d- d- serious news stories, and the thing that gets you all hot and bothered is mucky books. Linda from Milton Keynes. Good morning, Linda. Morning, Ian. Are you a fan of the Fifty Shades of the Grey? No, not really. No. Oh, <laughs> uh, why not? Have you read them? I've read all three, yeah. <laughs> it, took, it took you to read the whole trilogy before you realised you didn't like them. It was um, pretty boring, I thought, so they could have put it all into one book. Oh, really? Was it... Was yeah. It, I, 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 well, listen, we have to be careful. We do have young ears. Yeah, yeah. But I know um, that the main... There's a lot of duct tape, isn't there? The, the guy goes to a hardware store to buy equipment. That's right, yeah. For um, th- their uh, fun. Uh, was that a bit tame for you, then? Well, it wasn't tame. It was just... It was just boring, I thought. You really? know, it, um, yes, I think, you know. What, what were you hoping to get from the books that you didn't get? I don't know. Everybody was talking about it, and um, I thought, well, I must have a read of this and see yeah. what's happening, you know. But, um, well, no, it didn't do anything much for me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Have you got a, a boyfriend or are you married? No, I'm a widow. Oh, OK, OK. So you, 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 you used it to keep you warm at night. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> have, your, have your friends read it? Is it the kind of thing that all the girls are talking about? Yes, my friends read it, because I borrowed it from a friend, or three, but um, she said the same, you know, well, we could put it all into one book. Did you hear um, earlier on, Linda, our political reporter, Paul Scoynes, reading it? Yes. Did, did, did that make it a bit more exciting, having a, a, a well-spoken young man reading it? Well, yes, he's got a very nice voice, hasn't oh, he? He's got a fantastic voice, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. How about, well, sp- supposing, and I, you know, I can't promise anything, for Christmas we sent Paul Scoynes round to um, read and reenact pages from Fifty Shades. Would that make it more exciting? No. It certainly would. Okay, we'll make my Christmas. <laughs> we'll see what we'll see what we can do. <laughs> oh, Paul's listening at home now. He's writing his resignation letter this very second. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Now, I don't like the Rolling Stones, but I do like this new song of theirs, Doom and Gloom. Yes, please. Who'd have thought that 50 years after getting together, the Stones would record a decent song at last? I know. Yeah. Sicker than 50 years, but it was well worth the wait. I love that. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. What a, uh, what a mucky morning we're having. I can only apologise. Let's do something far less mucky. Should we talk about gritters? Gritters, yes. Gritters have been out in force around the three counties overnight as temperatures have dropped. Wasn't it cold this morning? Oh, it was bitter. Nearly 60,000 tonnes of salt is being stored at depots across beds, hearts and bucks in preparation for icy conditions. Our reporter, Tony Fisher, has been along to a highway depot in Stevenage. He spoke to Derek Twigg, the assistant network manager for Hearts County Council. Right, Derek, we're down at the depot here, just by the A1 and Stevenage. 
You've got a fleet of gritting lorries here. How many have you got? 58, is that right? 58 in total. There's uh, 15 here at um, Gorey's Mill. And so does that mean you have 58 routes to cover? That's right, we do. 58 routes to cover, 2,200 kilometres of road network to treat. And how do you know which, which roads to treat and which ones to leave alone, as it were? Uh, we will treat each road according to its priority. Obviously, the most busy roads first, and those with the highest speeds, and, and those that are key to the road transport network. Now, tell us about the salt that you use, because that's, uh, that's a bit different, isn't it? Yeah, we use a treated salt, which has got a, a, um, a molasses additive. Uh, we found that uh, with the national research that's been undertaken, we can reduce our salt usage, uh, therefore reducing our, our spread rates. And by adding the molasses, that helps the salt to stick to the road, is that right? That's correct, yeah. The, the salt actually goes into the target area where we want it to be. It doesn't blow onto the channels or in, onto the verges, so it's actually in the, the target area we want it to go. Right, my name's Chris Martin. I work for Ringway as a gritter operator, stroke manager. Uh, what we've got here is a six cubic metre gritter body mounted on an 18 ton tipper chassis. Salt is dropped in the top. Um, the salt comes out of the back of the lorry through a conveyor belt down onto a spinner and it's spun across the road as we go the lorry driver has got control of the width of the spread how much salt comes out the back and it's road speed related as well so once he gets up to 30 mile an hour he's still putting the same salt out as we would be at two mile an hour and how much salt do you put out per square meter um eight or 15 grams depending on the instruction so not very much not a lot but it'll go a long way sometimes we'll do one run overnight sometimes we'll do two runs and sometimes we're 24 hours a day. It just depends on the weather. I'm a county councillor, Stuart Pyle, cabinet member for highways and transport at Hertfordshire County Council. When we get severe weather, sometimes people say the roads haven't been gritted properly. The county council or whoever gets a lot of flack. But what do you say to people? I mean, there's some situations where actually gritting the roads when the temperatures are too low won't actually make any difference. Some of the difficulties that we have, of course, is that Salt, for example, is not a magic powder. It doesn't actually clear the roads. Uh, we need uh, vehicle traffic on the roads to churn the salt into the, the ice and snow and to turn it to brine. But even at, at brine doesn't uh, work effectively. Now, you're not obliged to grit footpaths, is that right? That's right, yeah. We have uh, in Hertfordshire 5,000 kilometres of, of footway, and we can't grit those. And, and again, even if we were able to grit them effectively, we would need that grit churned into the snow and ice. The DFT's recently uh, upgraded its advice, and you can clear snow and ice outside your house and outside your business premises, provided you do it carefully and you don't create another hazard, like leave heaps of snow everywhere. Roughly each gritting run each night for all 58 routes, 58 gritters, cost £30,000. What's your budget for gritting the roads? Um, this year... The budget's 3.4 million, but I stress that that is not cash limited. That if, God forbid, we have a, another bad winter, we just have to keep working and provide the funding to keep the rain roads open. So far, so good this winter, but we are expecting a cold snap in December with possible snow, so we're, we're ready for that. Tony Fisher reporting from a gritting depot in Stevenage. Listen, I'm having fun this morning. It's one of those shows where, you know, it's just perhaps more fun than perhaps it should be. First thing in the morning. You shouldn't be having fun on a breakfast show, for goodness sakes. Lots coming up in this hour of the show, and as always, we'd love to get your opinion on it. Uh, Lord Justice Leveson's long-awaited report into press standards will finally be published this lunchtime. Do you think the press should be regulated? The National Free Bus Pass Scheme for the Elderly and the Disabled is a financial time bomb. Should government money be spent on giving older people free bus passes? And a mucky month celebrating erotic fiction is proving to be very successful. Have you read Fifty Shades of Grey? I haven't. What's all the fuss about? BBC Three Counties Radio. And don't worry, if you missed it earlier on, we will be playing the clip of Paul Scoynes, our political reporter, reading certain extracts from Fifty Shades of Grey. If only. We should have... I know BBC doesn't do competitions, but we should have a competition. Win an evening with Paul Scoynes, where Paul Scoynes will uh, arrive at your house armed with Fifty Shades of Grey, some duct tape, and (laughs) and he will reenact various scenes from the book. I think he's slowly learning to hate me. 
Now, later on today, we will find out what Lord Leveson has to say following his long-running inquiry into media standards and behaviour. It looked into the tactics used by journalists to get their stories, which included, uh, included shocking revelations about phone hacking. It's also examined the relationship between politicians, journalists and the police. Here's a, a, an audio snapshot of what happened. After listening carefully, we've decided the best way to proceed is with one inquiry, but in two parts. I can tell the House that this inquiry will be led by one of the most senior judges in our country, Lord Justice Leverson. He will report to both the Home Secretary and the Secretary for Culture, Media and Sport. We'd gone up to the Bird's Eye Building to um, look at the CCTV and we were sitting downstairs in reception and I rang her phone. Yes. And it clicked through <clears throat> onto her voicemail, so I heard her voice. Yes. And I was... It, it was just like I jumped. She's, she's picked up her voicemails, Bob. She's alive. And I was just... It, it was then, really. I cannot, for the life of me, think of any conceivable source for this story in the, in the Mail on Sunday except those voice messages on my mobile telephone. I also remember being 13 and thinking, who, why on earth would anybody take a favour over £100,000, but being advised by management and by certain members of the record company um, to take the latter option, that he was a very, very powerful man. I was in the early stages of my career and could absolutely do with a favour of this magnitude. You wouldn't have been so undeft and cack-handed to have asked directly, would you, Mr Murdoch? I hope not. I've never asked a Prime Minister for anything. I listened to a tape of the message, yes. But it was a voicemail message, wasn't it? Uh, I believed it was, yes. Did you know that that was unethical? Uh, not unethical, no. What, what, why not? It's not? It doesn't necessarily follow that listening to uh, somebody speaking to somebody else is unethical. But on, on the tape of a voicemail message, you didn't think that was unethical? Well, it depends on the circumstances in which you're listening to it. Why are we all here? We're here because of the truly dreadful things that happen, not to politicians, but to ordinary members of the public whose lives have been turned upside down when they've already suffered through losing their, their, their children uh, and then have their lives turned upside down in a totally unacceptable way. And, you know, this is a sort of, I think, a cathartic moment where press, politicians, police, all the relationships that haven't been right, we have a chance to... Reset them, and that is what we must do. Well, someone who's taken a close professional interest is Ivor Gaber, who's a professor in media and politics at the University of Bedfordshire. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. What do you think of how the inquiry has been handled? Well, if you mean the Lord Leveson and his colleagues, I think they've actually handled it very well. It's a really difficult area, walking on eggshells. The one thing newspapers don't like is people looking at them, or at least people who aren't newspapers. So I think they've had, had a really tough job, and by and large... They've done a really good job, particularly the way they let, as you heard in that, that, that little selection just now, they let ordinary people, the victims' voices, being heard. I think that was really important, and almost as much as their, their, their recommendations, although probably not quite as much, the very fact that these people were given a voice, I think, was part of the, the, the positive outcome. What do you think was the most shocking thing that was discovered through this inquiry? Well, some of the things that were, quote, discovered, unquote, actually came out before... Um, in the revelations of the Guardian, unfortunately, perhaps the most shocking one was actually uh, probably not quite correct. That is, we've had we heard the Dowler, Mrs. Dowler speaking about the phone messages. Mm. Um, we were all shocked when we thought not only was the News of the World listening to those messages, they were also deleting those that they'd, they'd already heard. In fact, that turned out not to be true, but I think that was the most shocking thing that people will remember. But it was just generally that picture of the tra families who had a terrible tragedy, a daughter murdered, mm. uh, not just the Dowers, other families, um, then having to contend with newspapers revealing details about their uh, murdered children's lives. The, the, a lot of the newspapers have come out looking pretty seedy, haven't they? Grubby, yes, indeed. I think that's a fair word. D can they ever rebuild the trust of the public, do you think? Oh, yes. I think um, they can. I mean... Uh, just to, to confuse matters, to go back to the MP's expenses, mm. um, which, you know, we in Luton are pretty aware of what, with what's happening here, people were very shocked by it, but actually I was just looking at some statistics yesterday. The actual effect 
um, the election was not dramatic. So people can be shocked, but they move on. Um, I won't say forgive and forget, but uh, a lifetime's um, habits aren't necessarily changed. On the other hand, of course, people are buying fewer and fewer newspapers anyway, so those who are, if you like, marginal papers who might or might not buy a newspaper today after hearing the revelations might opt not to rather than to. So I think there is an effect, but I think it's a small effect. We've seen people like Steve Coogan and uh, Hugh Grant at the inquiry and being very vocal about what they claim to be an intrusion. How do you think the public feels about the intrusion to celebrities' lives? Because it's the public that buys the papers, isn't it, and makes it worthwhile? Yeah, I think think the public are are particularly ambiguous about intrusions into celebs' lives, whereas I think there's almost universal condemnation of intrusions into private individuals' lives. Um, There's a little bit in the public mood, whether it's right or wrong, that if these people court publicity, need publicity, have publicists, then they've got to take the rough with the smooth. So I do think the public, again, I stress, I'm not making it saying this is correct, but I think the the public do make a different judgment and are prepared, are actually interested in the the details of of, of public celebrities. It's odd, isn't it? Years years and years ago, Professor, I used to have a a, a tiny little television career, and uh, 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 looking back, it was obvious that about ten years ago, nine years ago, my phone was hacked. I I had that thing where um, the the various things happened, but the main thing was, I would go to my phone, it would say there was no new messages, but there would be four messages I hadn't heard before, so someone was obviously listening to them. Uh, It... It, I didn't have anything particularly interesting going on. It was a very, it, it, it's a very unpleasant feeling to be like that. Oh, I can imagine. It's like people who've suffered burglaries say, OK, they were frightened, but there's that sense afterwards that stays with them that their house has somehow been defiled because somebody else has been there, even if there's no damage. Mm. So I can understand that very, you know, and you think, it never quite leaves you, does it? I wonder if anybody's been listening to this. The thing is, all they heard was messages from my mum going, hello, Ian? <laughs> Ian? I don't think he's there. Is this recording? That's all they heard, so they're going to get no big story from it. But it's an odd thing. What do you think the outcome is going to be, uh, Professor, from, well, from the inquiry? I, I think there's going to be, well, I can predict, well, one can't often stick with that. There's definitely going to be a new system of regulation, mm. no question. The PCC, the Press Complaints Commission, is dead. Is it going to be self-regulation or government-imposed? Uh, I'm glad you asked me that question. I don't know. I mean, that is the big... Well, I suspect... That it, well, can you just... You said, is it going to be self-regulation? Or, yeah, I, I don't think the newspapers are going to be allowed to set up their own... Because they, they've against. proved, haven't they, that they can't look after yeah, themselves. Yeah. And I know that Dominic Mohan, the editor of The Sun, kind of wrote an open letter saying, give us one more chance, yeah. please. Well, they've had five chances. This is the fifth inquiry into the press since the war. So I know, I'm pretty sure that Lord Leveson is going to recommend a new system of well, government-backed, if you like, or... Um, press regulation but i'd be i i got I, i'm there will be no government political involvement in it of that i'm sure everybody's spoken against that so it's just the question of how do you do it do you do a bbc ofcom type system mm. or are there other models to look at but i think you're absolutely right there's going to be form of um, statutory backed regulation that is the government will set it up but then um, and i'll express a personal opinion hopefully at that point they walk away but i think everybody agrees they should not be involved how much longer are we going to have newspapers for? Oh, well, Five years, ten years? They're on the way out, aren't they? <laughs> Another good... Yes and no. I think mass, the, 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 there's always going to be a space for certain sort of specialists. Um, newspapers. But even then, actually, as I say it, and thinking about the Financial Times, actually, most copies of the Financial Times are now read online. You get everything from. I, I, yeah. I turn on my phone in the morning and I know what the news is. I, I can go to, to Google or Yahoo, I look at all of those sites, I can look at the front pages of the papers online. It, the, the, the printed newspaper isn't going to be around forever, is it? I, th- I, I think you're right. I wouldn't have agreed with you a couple of years ago, but I think the speed that this is happening uh, has taken everybody by surprise. And I, I suspect you're right, although I think it's going to be longer. I mean, I have to say people have been foretelling the death of various... I mean, you know, a ra- a radio was going to have killed the newspapers. Television was going to have killed radio. Mm. Um, online, internet m- 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 videos were going to kill TV. You know, the one thing we know about the media is we don't know. People's habits are not always predictable. So, yeah, I think it looks likely that we're, we're, national newspapers are going to die. I think there's always actually going to be a role for local papers, but I think national newspapers could be in serious trouble. But, you know, at the end of the people make predictions and they don't always turn out to be right. Well, we won't, Professor, we won't hold you to it, but thank you very much, Professor uh, Ivor Gaber, who is a uh, professor in media and politics at the University of Bedfordshire. 08459 455 555. Do you think that the, the newspaper should be regulated? That there should be an, an official government body that, that kind of hauls them in? They've done some pretty shocking things. Remember that the, there was a, a, a couple of years ago, there was a young woman got murdered and all the papers came out and said, oh, I was her neighbour. Her next door neighbour did it because he's got a funny haircut and looks a bit weird. 
Poor fellow had uh, her landlord. That was it. Poor fellow had absolutely nothing to do with it. His life was ruined. There needs to be some form of regulation, doesn't there? The BBC in beds, hearts, and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, do you have a free bus pass? Sorry, I was talking there with my microphone turned off. <laughs> I was thinking, why, why? This sounds a bit funny in my ears. It's because I had my microphone turned off. And I'm an idiot. Have you got a free bus pass? How often do you use it? It's being called a financial time bomb by urban transport authority bosses. They say the scheme could lead to a 75% spending cut uh, on other transport services. Well, Leo McKinstry is a Daily Express columnist. Morning, Leo. Good morning. What do you think about the scheme? Should it be scrapped? Well, I think it certainly should be modified. We are going through a great uh, financial crisis because of uh, the size of government spending. And this is happening right across the Western world. And governments are having to look at entitlements. And one of those is bus passes. And I think one of the first steps to take is to place some sort of age restriction on it so it isn't so costly to other transport users. And that means raising the age from 60 to retirement age, 60 65 at the minute and going up to 67 over the next few years. I mean, it's, in a way, it's ludicrous that someone might be in a quite a well-paid job uh, still working for the next few years and is actually getting a bus pass. And uh, we just can't go on affording to this. The government is going to have to make further huge cuts in public spending right across the board from education to welfare, and they're going to have to look at everything. And Bus pass entitlements are one of the things to look at. Leo, there will be um, people listening to this show, a lot of people listening, who, who do have uh, free travel passes, and they'll be saying, well, hang on a second, I've paid my tax, I've paid my NR, uh, uh, national insurance, I, d- I deserve to have a free pass. Well, a, that's always the argument wheeled out against any sort of cut on anything. We get that on uh, the NHS, I've paid my... I, I paid my taxes. We got it last uh, last year when the government was uh, looking at increasing uh, the tax rates, the marginal tax rates for pensioners. I, I've paid taxes all my life. I, I'm entitled to this. But the fact is the world has changed. Now we, the government has far less money. Uh, the population is growing. The population... Population that are the elderly proportion of the population is going up. I mean, in some ways, that's a good thing. We're all living longer, but it's ludicrous to pretend we can carry on with the world of the 1960s and 70s with all these huge changes in finance and the demographics of of age. I mean, if people are living far longer, that imposes an extra burden on the on the state, and it's just unaffordable at the minute. Isn't there a danger, Leo, that that older people who do uh, do have these bus passes and do rely on them that without them uh, they could isolate and become very lonely and, and not interact as much as they do. Well, let, I mean, there is a way to deal with that, is to say there's some sort of limit, and uh, if you can't really genuinely uh, hard up, uh, then maybe there can be some sort of concessions. But we've grown up with this image that all pensioners are on the bread line and that all pensioners are desperately hard up and need all the support they can from the state. In fact, that's not true. The, the proportion of wealthy people is very high amongst pensioners and uh, an awful lot of older people did extremely well out of the property boom uh, and also they're the ones who have jo- enjoyed until recently this golden age of pensions when people in work uh, build up big pension pots and uh, and now have quite a good income in their old age which have got people of my generation and I, I'm age 50, I don't have a pension at all and I don't know what uh, exactly Whoa. I'm going to do in old Leo, age. Leo you, you're, you're 50 yeah. and you haven't got a pension? Yeah, and I'm, uh, there's a huge I'm self-employed, there's a huge <laughs> number of people like me. Are you not worried? Yeah. Does that not worry you? Well, I, I, I mean, I, in a way, I'm lucky that I'm a writer, so I hope I, I'll be able to earn some sort of living yeah. for the rest. But, you know, it is a, a huge problem. You know, mm. we're talking about bus passes for the elderly, and there are huge numbers of people in my uh, well, in, in my position who don't have a pension or they have a tiny pension yeah. pot. You know, e- even if you have a pension pot of 100,000 quid, that's going to get you an income of about four or 5,000 when you, when you retire. So... That, that, that's the far bigger problem that's facing our country, the, the, uh, the, uh, the future generations and their income. Leo, we'll leave it there. Leo McKinstry, thank you very much. I always get scared when we talk about pensions. I've got one. It's tiny. 
haven't paid anything into it for the last 12 months. <laughs> I'm going to be so screwed when I'm old. No, I'm not. I'm going to get sensible. Well, our, our uh, bus pass correspondent, Justin Dealey, is out and about in the three counties. Morning, Justin. Yes, hello, Ian. Uh, plenty of views coming in about this. I'm I in Milton Keynes this morning talking to bus users. A few moments ago, I spoke to John. Well, John, you're going to be getting your free bus pass very soon. Do you think government money should be spent on handing out free bus passes? Well, I don't think it's a free... It's not a free bus pass, is it? It's a... It's a you paid at the system for so long, you paid, you paid your dues, you paid your taxes, and it's something... It's an entitlement. It's not, it's not free. It's nothing that's been given to you for nothing. You'd be very angry if somebody said to you, now you're due a free bus pass, sorry, you can't have one. You'd be furious, wouldn't you? Oh, of course I would. If it's an entitlement, it's something that everybody expects. If, if I reached 65 and I was told I wasn't going to qualify for a mortgage pension, I'd be very upset about that. Mm. And I think this is another, it's another entitlement. Like a pension, perhaps. So it's not free. People are paying into it all of their lives. And do you think, once again, it's time to pick on the pensioners in this country? Well, what's going to be next? Are they going to take away free prescriptions? You know, I don't know. Interesting views there from John again saying it is not free. Well, yesterday I jumped on a train. Today I jumped on a bus. I'm having quite a week, aren't I? I spoke to Terry. Well, I'm actually on the bus now with Terry, who's reading her paper this morning. Terry, in terms of pensioners getting free bus passes, are you in favour of that? If so, tell us why. Yes, I'm in favour of that. They've worked for probably most of their life and it's, they're struggling with the money, so it would be a good idea that they receive the free bus pass. So the idea of taking that away, in your opinion, is just simply wrong? Yes. And a word on Fifty Shades of Grey, talking about that oh, this morning. Have you read, read it? That. No, I haven't read that. <laughs> what about your friends? Um, some of them, yeah. yeah. Are they excited by it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very yeah. much. OK, thank you. That was Terry with our newspaper talking about bus passes and Fifty Shades of Grey there. But uh, I think, Ian, we're going to struggle to find anybody this morning using the buses who says, do you know what, it's about time we looked at this properly and we stopped giving pensioners bus passes because 99.9% of the people I speak to, and this comes up time and time again, they always say to me, people who are 65 and over, they simply deserve a free bus pass. It's interesting, isn't it, the the, the use of the word deserve a free Mm. bus pass because it's only because that's the culture that we have. If that culture didn't exist, then people wouldn't think that. Justin, stay there a second, because I'm yep. going to speak to Shirley. You, you might want to ch- chip in, Justin. Uh, Shirley's in Milton Keynes. Good morning, Shirley. Good morning, Do Amy. you have a bus pass? I do. Can I ask how old you are? 68. 68 years old. OK. Yes. We're going to take your bus pass off you to save the country a load of money. Yes. How do you feel about that? Disgusted. Why? Disgusted, because if I didn't have my bus pass, I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't go anywhere. I wouldn't be able to, because I wouldn't be able to afford to pay the fare. If we use it before 9.30, we have to pay 50 pence. Right. But after 9.30, we're, we're OK. But if, if I didn't have a bus pass, then I wouldn't be going anywhere, because I wouldn't be able to afford to. Shirley, uh, listen, I'm not necessarily speaking my thoughts. I'm just going to take the, the, the contrasting side of the argument. Tu- yes. Tough. Tough. Tough? Tough. Why? Oh, why, why should we pay for you to go out and have a social life? Do you know what? Do you know what my social life consists of? Go on. Going to church. Going to church and going to see my friend and doing my shopping. That's my social life. Maybe once a month I perhaps use the bus pass to go to Northampton with my friend or maybe to Bedford occasionally, but I haven't been... I went to Northampton Friday... And that was the first time for months because I've been laid up with a very bad leg. Where do you think the government can make savings then? If the, cause they have to save some money, and if if it's not going to be the bus passes, where else should they make cuts? Where else? Stop using it for their own flipping ends and and doing you know with their expenses. Well, that the expenses thing is sorted now. That's been sorted, so they've made cuts there. It? Has it? Has it indeed? Not what, what I've heard. What, what have you heard? I, well, when I've heard things on the television and the radio or read in the papers, they're still abusing it. No, I don't think they are abusing it now. It's, oh, I it's, think they are. No, I don't think they are. It's, they yes, can't. They are. No, they, no, surely they can't. It's been, it's been regulated. They can make legitimate it's, claims and uh, expenses. They, they know all the loopholes. They know the way round it. It's always a case of not the pensioner. Whenever we get a rise in our pension, it's gone before we ever get it, because everything's gone up. I don't know if you heard um, Leo McKinstry from the Daily Express, who was on a few minutes ago. I did hear some of it, yeah. He was saying that um, this generation of pensioners are perhaps the wealthiest they've ever been. You've, you've, <laughs> you've, uh, you've managed to play the old um, the property game. You've got a few quid in your back pocket. Oh, I wish. I wish. Shall I tell you how much I've got in my savings account? If you want to, you don't have to. £49. 
that's all I've got. I've got a mortgage because when I when my marriage broke down, I had to get my own mortgage so that I could keep my house, which I've lived in for 21 years. So you've got four years left on the mortgage? No, I haven't. Oh. I've got it until I'm 83. Oh, blimey. Shirley, listen, exactly. thank you very much. Olive's in Luton. Morning, Olive. Good morning. What do you think about these bus passes? We're going to take them off you to save the country money. Well, I think keep the bus passes, but um, if they're really short of money like that, yeah. charge... When Years ago, we used to pay 50p towards our bus pass. Yeah. So the only suggestion I could say is pay... Charges a bit on our buses fares. How about uh, 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 you have to pay two hundred pounds a year? That's not bad, is it? Free free bus travel for two hundred quid a year. Well, <laughs> I only use it about uh, if I'm lucky twice a month. Right. Um, I know other people do abuse it a lot and travel all over the country with it, but. Um, that wouldn't be Olive, in my pocket. Olive, listen, right. Uh, Justin Dealey, are you aware of my, our, our reporter, Justin, Olive? Pardon? Are you aware of our reporter, Justin? Yes. Justin, Justin, say hello to Olive. Hello, Olive. Hello. Good morning, you well? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Excellent. I'm now getting ready to go to the hospital, though. That's why I said to your lady this morning, Justin, if I didn't have that bus pass... Justin, never ask them how they're doing. Now, Olive, <laughs> To listen. take me through to the two... I have to get a bus from where I live. Down into town, get another one. But Olive, listen, yeah. Justin is Justin is a young man, okay? When he get when he reaches 60, 65, 68, there'll be no money left in the pot for his pension. He won't get a state pension. Sorry to tell you this, Justin, but Thank you're you, you're screwed. Yeah, <laughs> Why don't we give young men like him bus passes so he can make use of it while there's still a few quid left and take away yours? What now? Yeah. Oh <laughs> do you know when I was his age I used to walk into town, walk nearly everywhere, never used the bus. You see, Justin, you should be walking everywhere. I should be walking. What I would say, that this idea that, that all pensioners are loaded, they've got loads of property, they've got loads of money. You know, I'm out reporting five days a week. I'm just being honest and, and the people that I've spoken to, that certainly isn't the reality from my point of view and the people that I've spoken to. Uh, Justin, thank you very much. Olive, thank you very much as well. Across beds, hearts and bugs, this is BBC Three Counties Radio. Very busy between now and 8 o'clock. Very busy, including... Coming up in the next hour, a uh, half hour or so, a month celebrating erotic fiction at Luton Library is proving to be a huge success. I haven't read Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm guessing you probably have. What's all the fuss about? And you'll get to hear something very, very special in a few minutes. And man alive, wasn't it cold last night? Gritters across the three counties have been out in force. Our reporter Justin Dealey is going to be at the Gritter de- I've got to be so careful how I say this. The Gritter Depot in Milton Keynes, finding out what they've been up to. Also, bad customer service. Any examples you've got of bad customer service? Could you give us a call and let me know, please? I'll tell you what, there's a cracking story. It's in the mail. It's also in the Telegraph. Tourist who complained received a four-letter email reply. A tourist who complained about conditions on a trip to Mexico received expletive-laden emails from a holiday firm employee calling her a moaning B1TCH. Gemma Fish visited the country on a £3,000 Thompson holiday with her partner for a Valentine's break. Shortly after arriving, she complained to the holiday firm by email that she was unhappy with the standards of the hotel. In reply, Ms Fish received a series of abusive emails. One told her to shut the bleep up. Here's some of the emails. Let me, I'll, I'll read these out and censor them. Gemma, do you really think we give a bleep? Because we don't. So shut the bleep up with your moaning and book with Thomas Cook. Because we don't want your custom. Lol. Gemma, we're so- sorry that your room is nothing like you thought it would be. But if you need to go and see your rep, but she really won't really give a bleep. That's pretty bad, isn't it? I've had some cracking rows on the phone with, uh, well, with Royal Mail. Royal Mail treated me terribly. In the end, they treated me really well. Because, and I'm ashamed to say this, I did the I work for the BBC thing. I did that. I had to do it. They lost £400 worth of stuff that I'd sent. Special recorded delivery. They refused to refund it until I did the, I work with the BBC. And they went, oh, okay, we'll sort it out. Which was terrible, you have to do that. But they did sort it out. A box company, oh... I spoke to the man, uh, the manager. The next day I spoke to him again and he pretended to be someone else. Very frustrating. Your terrible examples of customer service, please. 08459 455 555. What do you think 
Here's a tangent. The biggest selling book is since records began in the UK. The Bible? No. I t- I t- I let me give you a clue. The surge of jealousy I felt only moments ago tells me that I have deeper feelings for him than I had admitted to myself. Wednesday, he confirms, and he leans forward and kisses me softly. Something changes while he's kissing me. His lips grow more urgent against mine. His hand moves up from my chin, and he's holding the side of my head, his other hand on the other side. He's breathing... That was our political reporter, Paul Scoynes, reading an extract from his autobiography that's out this Christmas. It's not. It was Paul Scoynes making women go weak at the knees across the three counties by reading extracts from Fifty Shades of Grey. The book has sold over five million copies. Here. And today the author E.L. James will give her first TV interview. Earlier on we heard from head librarian Fiona Marriott about an erotic literature exhibition taking place at Luton Library. I've, I've redubbed it Mucky Month. She bought in some very rude books, which I, I had a little glimpse at. Oh, where's that gone? That's disappeared. Well, we'll, we'll have that a little bit later on then. We'll, but in the meantime, we can speak to Nikki Hodgson, who is a sexual politics journalist and author of the novel Bound to You, currently in the bestsellers list. Morning, Nikki. Morning, Ian. Why are women going mad for this kind of stuff? Well, I think it's that women have always been going mad for it. They just haven't had access to it. So what you're seeing isn't a new trend um, in terms of uh, women's appreciation of sexual material. They're just finally, Fifty Shades has democratised the spread of erotica and everybody's got access to it all of a sudden. Fifty Shades of Grey has been, uh, been very popular, but I- I've heard that it's quite badly written. Uh, I would say so. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to do the horrible thing here and say that my book, which is actually a memoir, I have to correct, a real-life memoir ba- based on my real experiences wow. as um, a professional dominatrix and then a personal submissive. Um, I only had six weeks to write it, but I think it is a little bit better written. And I think if you look at the quality of the other novels that are out there, um, those people have had more time and uh, more agency to get about, you know, spending more time writing them. So, yeah, I mean, Fifty Shades isn't so brilliantly written, but the point is the, pl- the story's very compelling and it's clearly hooked a lot of people in. Does your, does your book have pictures? Um, no, but it has, like, incredibly graphic descriptions, so you get the picture very wow. quickly. Wow. Uh, and does it start... Because the problem that I've heard with Fifty Shades of Grey, it doesn't start till page 100. Is yours straight in there? Oh, yeah. Eh, good work. <laughs> <laughs> and I was surprised... We had a librarian earlier on, and I was surprised that this... You said this stuff has been around literally for hundreds of years, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it kind of goes in under the radar. I didn't know that Jilly Cooper was mucky. Oh, yeah. I mean, Julia Cooper is like the archetypal. That's what I'm saying. Like, this stuff has been around for yeah. ages. You've had the black lace imprint for years. But it's just that, you know, for various different reasons, you know, a serendipitous set of circumstances, certainly for E.L. James, it just enabled. And also because of the way that the book was first, um, you know, available through, like, e-distribution mm. through the internet, that definitely helped people. You know, it was like word of mouth that kind of popularised it, and then it, it sort of took off of its own accord. Wait, now, your book is a memoir, Nikki. Yeah, mine is, yeah. Were you not... Uh, is it, is it um, No Holds Barred? No, it's No Holds Barred. It's very explicit. It, it, were you not embarrassed? What is, I don't know if your parents are still around. What does your <laughs> mum think? Yeah, my mum's I care about it. My parents knew what, know what I'm like. You right. know, I've been writing about this stuff for a long time. I've never written about my own life in so much graphic detail. But the point was, I had um, a, a very tempestuous relationship with uh, a real life Christian Grey, and it was like very destructive. So yeah. it was important to me to sort of set the record straight. Because the one thing about these erotic novels is they are they are fantasy. So you're not meant to take them as kind of instruction manuals. But we also need to have. Um, a more open discussion about what happens if you do get involved in this kind of relationship and it goes wrong. So that's what I was, to some extent, trying to do with my book. Although there is, you know, it's also meant to erotically entertain people and I've had really good feedback. People have really, really enjoyed it so far, so... And is it... Because men work differently, don't they? Men like pictures and women like, like kind of words and descriptions. It's kind of interesting. That's what we get told. I mean, if you look at psychological studies, um, uh, people, uh, psychologists have found that women are just as aroused by sexual images. Uh, And so, but culturally speaking, yes, that's, that's the kind of, that's the go-to um, uh, piece of advice that Mm. people give us. You know, that's how men respond. That's how women respond. So, um, yeah, there is something about women do tend to like words for some reason, for some extra reason. This really, really appeals to women. But, you know, men have... The, the other thing that's really important about, about this erotica boom is that men have always had access to sexually explicit material, you know, and men always produced it, historically speaking. So it's kind of a way of sort of evening up the scales a little bit. 
Is there not a worry that it might give give men um, the wrong idea? One of the books that we, we had brought in earlier on was called In Too Deep, mm-hmm. um, and it was about uh, a, a gentleman leaving very naughty notes in the librarian's inbox. Now, if you did that in real life, you'd go to prison, wouldn't you? Yeah, but like I say, these books are about fantasy. Yeah. So you've got to understand that you read this thing because, it, you know, you, you can in- have pleasure from reading it. It doesn't mean that you have to ena- enact what's in there. But then also, if you have, you know, a partner and you go about doing the right research, you can have um, a very healthy kink relationship. You know, there are ways of doing it that won't get you in prison and um, that will give both of you a lot of pleasure. So I, I we t- just need to have more discussion about that in general. I tell you what, no, no, you don't. I tell you why I don't want to have discussion about this. <laughs> No, I tell you why, because my mum, my mum is not very well, okay, she can't read, she's, she can't see very well, and she, she has a reader, and I had my mum on the phone the other day saying, Ian, I'm furious with my reader, she refused to read a book for me. I said, what book was that, mum? 49 Shades of Grey. I, no, I don't want to have discussions with my mum about... Well, you should, no, 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 but we, we shouldn't be talking to our family members about I don't it, want to but we should be talking to our partners about it, that's my point. Oh, dear. In this society, we have a real problem with being open about sex, and yeah, it, it, it impedes us. It impedes... No, 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 it's, not, it's <laughs> it fine. It's, pro- it's not appropriate to talk to your mum about no. it, but it is a to- appropriate to talk to your partner and to be able to... It, explore desires with people and it's why we have a problem with rape and about consent and all these issues because we don't know how to talk openly with one another about what we want and what's okay to want nikki the book is called uh, bound to you it's, it's doing pretty well is it it's doing very well so far and like i said i've had really really good feedback it's far filthier than 50 shades <laughs> so if you've read 50 shades and you want something even spicier please buy my book you've totally got to have that on the strap line on the front <laughs> filthier than 50 shades nikki hodgson thank you very much uh, indeed well earlier on we did uh, speak to head librarian fiona marriott uh, about an er- erotic literature exhibition taking place at Luton Library. She brought in some very re- rude books. I had a little look. He's reading. Sorry, I <laughs> <laughs> I am reading it. It is. Um... Oh, I mean, this is from 1748. It's absolutely filthy. There's an interesting story behind this, wasn't there? It was written in a debtor's prison or something. It was, and I think it was written in order to actually pay for him to get out of the debtor's prison. Unfortunately, as soon as he came out of prison, he was arrested for writing the book. Good. So it didn't actually work that well. But it is a classic. It's been around um, in one form or another for centuries. Erotic fiction. A, a new phenomenon? No, it's ancient, actually. Um, one of the first novels that we've got in the collection is from 1748. Wow. And it's a book that a lot of people will actually recognise called Fanny Hill. They may have found it by dad or mum's bedside when they were children and the book would be whisked off them before they could actually read it. This is written in 1748. They didn't have sex in 1748, did they? Oh yes, they did. And actually they were much more free and easy about it than we are today, I think. When the Victorians came along, they repressed an awful lot of stuff. But before that, everybody was kind of relaxed about sex and people didn't even get married until they had children. Right. Dear listener, be honest, you can use a pseudonym, you can call up and use a different name, you can put a voice on if you want. Have you read this book? Have you read Fifty Shades of Grey? Have you read Nikki's book? Bound to You. I wonder what that's about. 08459 455 555 Have you read it? Do, do, do these books, what do you get from these books? We have had a couple of callers this morning saying, oh, I read Fifty Shades of Grey, it's a bit boring. Really? Apparently it's not that well written. It sold five million copies. That's not bad for a book that's not particularly well written. I'm going away on a trip today, and in my bag I have Danny Baker's autobiography and a book about Patsy Cline. That's what I've got. Nothing mucky. I couldn't, I couldn't sit on an aeroplane or on a train or anything like that reading a mucky book. You'd get funny looks, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Am I just being prudish and ridiculously old-fashioned about this? There are uh, uh, calls to abolish free travel for pensioners and disabled people. It's it's a financial time bomb waiting to happen. Apparently according to uh, various reports that are going flying around the government. What do you think about that? Do you, are you a pensioner? Do you use your bus pass? Do you really need it? 08459 455 555. Len is in Hemel Hempstead. Morning, Len. Good morning, Ian. Len, uh, uh, you're, you're not a pensioner, are you? Yes. You've got the voice of a young gentleman. Thank you very much. May I ask, sir, how old are you? 78. So, well, blimey, OK. 78 years old. Do, you don't need a bus pass, Len. I'm totally blind. Right. And I need to get into the towns and everything, and people have to guide me around. So, yeah. you know, um, we do need our bus passes. 
What? But, but, but really, do you need it, Len? Surely you've, you've got a few quid stashed away. We were hearing no. from a guy from the Daily Express earlier on saying that you, all you old people are, are, are loaded. No, we're not. Do you know how much... I'll tell you how much my pension is. Go it's £106 a week. Yep. And I've done 42... 40, I, I've worked over 50 years to get that pension. Yeah. Now, I did quite a long time in the army, and I was fighting for this country all over the place. Now, Mr Cameron promised in his manifesto... Yes. ...we're not going to hit the blind people for anything, or the disabled, or the elderly. Yeah. And that was a manifesto promise. Well... When Mr Clegg and Mr Osborne got into coalition with them... Yeah. They decided, oh, we'll hit the pensioners. Len, Len, listen, with the, the, with they've Len, taken the, part of our fuel allowance. The country's running out of money. We're, we're bankrupt. Oh, we need. What? We we've already paid that money into this country in our in our incomes and our, our taxes. So why are we being penalised? Because of irresponsibility of these governments. Where do you should... know what they should do? Go on, tell me. Cut the. Uh, benefits given to these MPs. Cut benefits. The, yeah, the um, expenses. Yes, all the expenses. Well, also, the... when they get into power, they <sighs> vote themselves a massive rise. I don't think they've had a pay rise for a while, the MPs. Oh, and also... they did. Last, a couple of years ago, they had quite and a also, big pay rise. And the, expense, the expenses problem has been sorted out. That's no, the... it hasn't. Well, it has. They, they just how, make... many, how many of them have been told to pay back the money? How many of them have been prosecuted and, and jailed? But, Only two. But they have... Out they... of 640... But they have clamped down on that, so it's, you can't... Yeah, it's still going abuse, on. You can't abuse the system still... anymore. Oh, yes, you can. There's legitimate There's claims. There's all loopholes in that system. It's not legitimate claims. They can go in and... I'll tell you something. They can go in and get a petrol receipt. Yeah. They have to get a petrol receipt. So, so what do they do? They go in and say, oh, just put 20 quid extra on it. No, they don't. You, 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 can't, you can't listen, Len. I get petrol receipts. You can't go into Shell or Esso and say put another 20 quid on it. It doesn't work like that. On the receipt, it does. No, it, it doesn't. If you've got to it write out doesn't. a receipt... Look, I work... When I... Len, the army. I worked in a petrol. They station, don't. They don't so handwrite. <laughs> Len, on. they don't handwrite petrol receipts anymore. It's well, all printed on I'm computers. Listen about my time. Okay. Well, then, listen. I, I suspect that if this were to happen, I suspect a seventy-eight-year-old blind man like yourself, sir, would, would, an ex-soldier. I'm sure you'd be all right. Yeah. Len, but, you know, on £106, don't expect us to have to pay. Good lad. Len, <laughs> Len thank, I've got to end it there. Thank you very much indeed, Len, in Hemel Hempstead. Well, he's, he's feisty and he's angry. What do you think? 08459 four double five five double five. Uh, after nine o'clock, Jonathan Vernon-Smith is going to be picking up the baton and running with it. He'll be asking on the big phone-in, should the country save money and scrap bus passes? You've got to think, everyone is making cuts everywhere. Okay, we, uh, as a country, we're in a lot of trouble. You think, you think the cuts, the cuts haven't st- even started yet. They haven't even started yet. You wait until they do. Bus passes, do we, do we need them? Oh, wait, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. Temperatures have dropped overnight. It's freezing out there and gritters have been out in force across beds, hearts and bucks. BBC Three Counties Radio has learnt that our councils have close to 60,000 tonnes of salt ready to be spread on the roads. Our reporter Justin Dealey is at a gritting depot in Milton Keynes. Justin! Oh, oh, Ian, it's freezing this morning. <laughs> isn't, it, or isn't it chilly? It's, it's really oh, changed in the yeah, last couple of days. It really has. Uh, I'm live in Milton Keynes this morning. I'm at uh, the Salt Barn in Bleak Hall. Joining me live here in our radio car is Mo- Bo- Mark Bowater. Mark is the Highways Operations Manager for Milton Keynes Council. That is your salt room. Wow, that is incredible. We'll take a photograph of that and put that on our Facebook page. How much salt do you have here then, Mark? At the moment, we have just over 2,500 tonnes. We started the season with just under 3,000. And where's it all come from? It comes from a place in Cheshire. It's a big salt mine up there run by Salt Union. And it's pretty special, this salt as well, isn't it? Yeah, this salt, um, we started with it last year. It's basically a coated salt with molasses, which helps it uh, stick to the roads and give us a better product. Just saying to Ian there, it's very, very cold this morning. So what happened last night in Milton Keynes? Yeah, we had the gritters out from 7 o'clock last night. Uh, We have 11 routes. They completed them all in about two and a half hours. So by sort of 10 o'clock last night, Milton Keynes was gritted. 
everyone's very busy. I presume it's your busiest time, certainly, for this winter. You've got a plan of action in place for this weekend when temperatures again are going to drop. Yeah, we're look, already looking ahead towards the weekend. Uh, guys are on standby, ready to go. We'll monitor the situation day by day. Um, we'll probably have two or three runs before then anyway. Are you convinced everything is in place to keep Milton Keynes safe this winter? We'll do our best. Uh, the problem is it's nature. It depends what it throws at us and how much, how quickly. A lot of people, Mark, again, I'm being honest here, will often have a go at you. They'll be phoning us saying, where are the grissers? There's ice everywhere. They're not doing their job properly. What would you like to say to those people this morning? Well, we do our best. The problem is we'll put the grit down as quickly as we can, um, but it takes the cars to grind it in, things like that. With frosts and minor ice, we can deal with quite quickly. When the snow starts to come, it obviously takes a lot longer, and it depends on the temperatures. We'll do our best, like I say, to keep Milton Keynes clear. A lot of councils, they don't grit the, the, the footpaths. Here in Milton Keynes, you've got the redways, so it's a, a slightly different situation here, isn't it? Yeah, it's very different, really. We have two little redway gritters which are parked over in the corner there. They'll go out and grit the redways. They've got little ploughs on to help clear them of snow. And they also go in the city centre. We have um, the hand gangs going round, both Stoney, Wolverton, Oney, Bletchley. So we're trying to do as many footpaths as we can. And people, of course, can keep up to date with social media. You're on Twitter, and be careful how you say this. Yeah, we're on Twitter, and we're Twit for Grit MK. (laughs) Fantastic. So, OK, everything's in place here. Ian can probably hear in the background all the gritters are here. Uh, We're talking about Fifty Shades of Grey this morning as well, because the lady who wrote that book is giving her first TV interview today. Have you read it? No, I haven't read it. Apparently Gareth has. Can you go and find Gareth for me? Yeah, I'll in two seconds. <laughs> Can to get Gareth over here? Um, he's coming out of the, the, the Grissa van right now. Of course, he will be going on the roads very soon. So don't worry, Milson Keynes residents. He's, he's on his way out. Here comes Gareth, joining us live in the radio car. Gareth, you're live on three counties. Please Hello. don't swear. Sound like Davina there. Uh, <laughs> your wife has read Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, she has, several yeah. times. Yeah. Has it changed your life and keep it clean? It's made it a bit more exciting. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> that was Gareth, who's read Fifty Shades of Grey. So, a final word with you then, Mark. Everything's here, everything's in place. You're going to be out later on this evening, so people will be seeing you, won't they? They will. They'll see the vehicles out. I would imagine it'll be 7 o'clock tonight or 4 o'clock in the morning, but we'll make that decision around lunchtime. Oh, and one final question. Um, these grissers we're talking about here, very high-tech, how much are they worth? Depending on which ones you're looking at, the one to our right at the moment is about seventy, eighty thousand pounds. Wow. The ones at the back there probably a hundred thousand. Very interesting. Thank you so much for your time. That's uh, Mark Bowwater joining us live here in Milson Keynes. He's the Highways Operations Manager for Milson Keynes Council. Ian, it is very loud here, but it just proves that people are here, they're working, they're making plans for later on today, and of course throughout the weekend when it gets even colder. You um you amaze me, Justin. Why? <laughs> the, 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 the majestic and seamless way you managed to weave all of our stories together. Yeah. Could, uh, asking I'm these big free bus passes. Uh, yeah. I know I was about to, <laughs> these big burly fellas, and you're going up to them yeah. saying, "By the way, have you uh, read Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> Incre- excellent work, Justin. Have you, Thank you. By Ed. the way, have you read Fifty Shades? Uh, no, I haven't read it. However, I do know other people who have read this book. And all right, a friend of yours is it? <laughs> okay, yeah, a friend of yours has yes, read it, Justin. A friend yes. of mine has read this book. Yes. And uh, the feedback that I'm getting from this book is, in actual fact. There's nothing too smutty, nothing too dirty about it. Books in the past have been far worse, but they just haven't had the publicity machine, yes. let's say. Do you do you own cable ties and duct tape? Um, no. OK, Justin Dilley, thank you very much indeed. Uh, he, he is good, isn't he? I could never weave as many stories as he does into one uh, onlooker. We get our money's worth of Dilley, that's what I'm saying. Uh, bus passes. Um, a text, uh, some text here, 81333, starting your text 3CR. Try and put your name on if you can. Uh, Ian, my mum gave up driving due to her age, and without her bus pass, she would be housebound. You don't automatically get a free bus pass, you have to apply for it. Better off people don't usually, it's the poor who do. Stop paying out foreign aid and look after the ones who built this country up from nothing. Do you, do they really want bus drivers on the dole, says Alan St Albans. Well, there's one or two bus drivers I wouldn't mind seeing on the dole. I do, I know, most of them are excellent. I've got a couple, I've got one who's my nemesis. Yeah, we'll talk about that another day. Ian, I agree with the blind gentleman. I'm partially sighted, I live on my own, I'm not allowed to drive and I live in a village. I'm not entitled to council tax, I'm not entitled to housing benefit and I'm struggling. I rely on my bus pass. My wage is £1,045 a month. I rely on my mobile and my internet to keep in touch with my mum who lives in Wales. Of course bus passes are really needed. I bet you drive, you lot. Oh, it's been a busy show this morning. 
We're bouncing all over the place. Lots more to come up between now and nine o'clock. Keep listening, and I'll speak to you after the latest news and sport with Catherine Boyle. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's just gone eight o'clock. It's Thursday. It's blooming cold. Ah, lots coming up in the last hour of the show, including Lord Leveson is to publish his report into the culture, practice and ethics of the press. How far should journalists be able to go? A woman who's had five heart attacks was turned away from hospital in Wickham and told to go back into the car park and phone an ambulance. Her husband will be joining me in the studio in about 20 minutes. Do you feel that your local hospital cares about you? And should free bus passes be scrapped for the elderly? Urban Transport Authority leaders say it's a financial time bomb. Lots of ways you can get in touch. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send us a text, 81333, starting your text 3CR. Or, and this is the best way to do it, isn't it? Give us a phone call, 08459... Four double five, five double five. BBC Three Counties Radio. Well, after about a hundred days of hearings, hundreds of witnesses, and thousands of pages of evidence, the Leveson Inquiry will report later today. It's been looking into the culture, practice, and ethics of the press, and particularly how the industry should be regulated. Among the controversial issues it's looked at are phone hacking and the close relations between the press, senior politicians and the police. Whatever the conclusions, it's clear the report will have huge implications for journalists. Here's a snapshot of what happened. After listening carefully, we've decided the best way to proceed is with one inquiry, but in two parts. I can tell the House that this inquiry will be led by one of the most senior judges in our country, Lord Justice Leverson. He will report to both the Home Secretary and the Secretary for Culture, Media and Sport. We've gone up to the Bird's Eye building to um, look at the CCTV and we were sitting downstairs in reception and I rang her phone. Yes. And it clicked through <coughs> onto her voicemail, so I heard her voice. Yes. And I was, it, it was just like, I jumped. She's, she's picked up her voicemails, Bob, she's alive! And I was just, it, it was then, really. I cannot for the life of me think of any conceivable source for this story in the, in the Mail on Sunday, except those voice messages on my mobile telephone. I also remember being 13 and thinking, who, why on earth would anybody take a favour over £100,000? But being advised by management and by certain members of the record company um, to take the latter option, that he was a very, very powerful man. I was in the early stages of my career and could absolutely do with a favour of this magnitude. You wouldn't have been so undeft and cack-handed to have asked directly, would you, Mr Murdoch? I hope not. I've never asked a Prime Minister for anything. I listened to a tape of the message, yes. It was a voicemail message, wasn't it? Uh, I believed it was, yes. Did you know that that was unethical? Uh, not unethical, no. W- why not? It's not? It doesn't necessarily follow that listening to uh, somebody speaking to somebody else is unethical. But on, on the tape of a voicemail message, you didn't think that was unethical? Well, it depends on the circumstances in which you're listening to it. Why are we all here? We're here because of the truly dreadful things that happen, not to politicians, but to ordinary members of the public whose lives have been turned upside down when they've already suffered through losing their, their, their children uh, and then have their lives turned upside down in a totally unacceptable way. And, you know, this is a sort of, I think, a cathartic moment where press, politicians, police, all the relationships that haven't been right, we have a chance to... We set them, and that is what we must do. Well, 86 politicians from all three major parties have written a letter to a national newspaper urging David Cameron not to bring in new press laws. They include the senior Conservative, Peter Lilly, who's MP for Hitchin and Harpenden. He's in our Millbank studio this morning. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Why do you think the press shouldn't be regulated by law? Because there are sometimes uh, the status quo, however bad, 
uh, is better than the alternatives. Just as Churchill said, democracy is the worst system of government except for all the alternatives. A free press, unregulated by the state and politicians, may be the worst system, but it's better than all the alternatives, including statutory regulation. Broadcasters have always had statutory regulation, and yet that's still a kind of free press, uh, the free news outlet, isn't it? No, uh, not really. It's uh, you don't much think? more biased, much more regulated. I've been uh, uh, libelled by the press and uh, exactly the same label by the media. The newspapers paid up and apologised. Uh, the broadcast media did nothing. But the, 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 some people would say that the newspapers do have too much freedom. Now, we were talking about the, uh, the, the uh, young girl who was murdered a couple of years ago and her landlord was kind of outed as being the murderer because he was a little bit weird, a little bit eccentric. The fella had nothing to do with it. That's unfair, isn't it? Oh, it is. I'm, I'm not suggesting that the press either now or if you had a system of statutory regulation would be pure and good. The press are reptiles, uh, <laughs> but they're a necessary evil. We should allow a free press to operate. Let's remember that this particular inquiry was set up because of phone hacking and because of bribing the police. Both of those are against the law. The law should be enforced. We don't need to set up an independent regulator empowered to create new laws, which will be at its own invention, and enforce them with powers delegated to it by uh, parliament and politicians. That is uh, an irrelevance, an absurdity, uh, and we should focus on the, the, the original issues. Phone hacking, let's stop it. Mm. Bribing police, let's root it out. But the press have shown, haven't they, they, they can't regulate themselves. Uh, well, perhaps... <laughs> who's going to regulate them? Uh, some well, group it, it of the great the... and the good, who, uh, like the sort of people who run the BBC, uh, I think that would give us less choice and less variety. Peter, low media. blow. Low blow. <laughs> well, 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 there's nothing for something. But the, the, news, the newspapers have proved... That they can't regulate themselves. They can't. They, they've had so many opportunities to do it, and they can't do it. But your sort of default position is there must be someone regulating. There must be a great, good, wonderful person yes. telling us all how to behave. Who's going to be this dictator? Well, I don't know. That's the question. But well, I, 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 think... I much prefer not to put powers in that, that hand and leave it in the hands of a variety of different journalists and okay. editors, some of whom will misbehave. Even though they've they proved that they the can't law, do it. They should go to jail. Even though they've proved they can't do it. They bully people. They pick on people. They lie about people. They, they, they have proved... Time and time again, they're not capable of doing it. In regulated broadcast media like yours, we see that they publish programmes accusing, you know, initially unnamed Tories of being paedophiles and all this sort of thing. So that's a regulated medium. That's what happens. And then then that's going through... Statutory regulation doesn't work. No, but then that's going through a, a, a process where that is being investigated by Ofcom... By uh, the BBC. By the BBC, I don't know about Ofcom. Well, Ofcom will be. If, if a complaint is made to Ofcom, even if it's one complaint by a lunatic, the, the Ofcom have to investigate it. That's, that's the beauty of having a statutory regulatory body. But in my experience, they're pretty toothless. And as I say, we've got a very one-sided broadcast media, which tends to be left of centre. That's very cosy for the sort of people who want more regulation. They would like that sort of ethos spread on the... Uh, bro- uh, the written journals as well I think it's better to have a bit of variety you've got a left wing BBC, you've got some right wing newspapers uh, I don't want them all controlled and given the same ethos Well I don't know necessarily the BBC's left wing but there are, you, you, one could argue that Sky is, is certainly more right wing than the BBC if, if that's what, you, what your fear is, that there are other alternatives Well that's a bit of a relief yeah. Well, but so you think? It, but you, let me just get this straight, Peter. You think it's okay for newspapers to lie I don't and think imply? It's okay. Lots of wrong things happen. They they ruin people's lives. How is that acceptable? Well, if they hack uh, phones, that's against the law. Yeah, they, if they, there they, are they... other activities that are clearly wrong. They should be enshrined in law, laid down by Parliament and enforced by judges. Not give some discretionary power to a bunch of the great and the good to lay down their own rules and to decide at their discretion how they should be implied. Let me give you an example. Please do. We went through Back to Basics a few years ago and all the press turned on the then government and uh, every MP, well, you know, anyone of any prominence, had the, uh, the press on them. They were around my street, my house and my neighbours yep. asking people whether they, would, uh, they knew any filth about Lily, offering money in the local pubs. Do you know any... St- stories of uh, nastiness about Lily. Fortunately, they didn't, or at least if they did, they didn't tell They kept quiet, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, are we going to say that this group of uh, regulators would have the power to turn on and off such a witch hunt? 
Now, I would have liked someone to turn it off, but I think it's wrong that anyone should be empowered mm. to say, oh, let's protect that group of, of, of politicians from this manifestly wrong mm. uh, doing. So you're giving far too much power to an unelected, unsupervised body to control the press. We've had a free press through for 300 years. Let's not go back on that. Peter, fascinating. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Peter Lilly there, who uh, is the MP for Hitchin and Harpenden. What do you think about it? Should the press be regulated? Should there, there be somebody who is kind of in control? Oh, wait, 459, 455, 555. I can see... The thing is, I don't, know what my, I don't know where I stand on this. I can see arguments for and against it. Of course there should be a freedom, but then lives are ruined. I don't know. I genuinely don't know what the answer is on this. <laughs> why would I know? That bloke that used to do the 11 o'clock show, why, why would he know what the answer is? I, I don't know where I sit on this at all. I'm, I'm prepared to be guided and informed by you. 08459 455 555. Uh, bus passes. It's a financial time bomb giving out bus passes to the elderly and the disabled. We need to stop it. That's according to uh, some people in the government. Barry's in Hemel. Morning, Barry. Good morning, Ian. We're going to get rid of bus passes. What a load of rot. Go on, why? Uh, Well, basically, you're talking about getting rid of bus passes. You you had uh, Len on a few moments ago talking about the the pension. Yes. Which I I happen to know Len. Um, He's blind. He was a paratrooper. He was a sergeant major. He's gone through life paying into schemes. Yes. Uh, Why should they now be taken away from him? Now, this sets a precedent. Mm. The government is expecting people to pay into private pensions. Now, in 40 years' time, those private pension companies run out of money. Are they going to cut out the pensions that they're supposed to pay out just because... You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's absolutely stupid. Barry, there are, there are, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to keep this brief, but, but, but there are people who would say, listen, the whole country is, we're making cuts everywhere, to libraries, to the NHS, to everything. Why should we subsidise some old people getting free transport down to the, the Derby and Joan Club or down because to the shops? We, because we're paying it to scrounging no-good benefits. Everybody's getting... They should cut benefits down, not to £500 a week, as they're saying, but to the same as a pensioner gets. Barry, listen, we have to end it there. Thank you very much. Oh, dear, I've just... I, I, for those who don't know, I've not banged on about it as much as perhaps I should. I'm after the show. I'm jumping into a luxury car... My polo. I'm driving to Heathrow Airport to travel economy class to New York City to go and see the monkeys. And, Jonathan, you've just, you've just said, oh, I'll, I'll give you the information of a fantastic restaurant. I know, uh, I know the best restaurant in New York for burgers. Yeah, what is it? And uh, it's called Le, Le Singver. Ooh. It's a French... Uh, it means the Green Monkey, I think. Ooh, Green Monkey Burgers. It's an amazing uh, restaurant for burgers. Delicious burgers. Do they do vegetarian burgers? No. Hey. No, I forgot you're a vegetarian. That's a bit... So, I won't give you the, the details. Well, they will be completely lost on you. Well, they might do, like, nice, nice cheesy fries... They might do. Onion rings. Are you going to listen to radio when you're over there? Z100. <laughs> you're listening to Z100, and I think that we should send everyone back home. That's what they do. They're very uh, outspoken, aren't when they? When I was in New York, I went to see WABC, which is the big talk station where Rush Limburgh was. Oh, yes. And trying to get in the building, yeah. the security you have to go through to get in the building, they're up on, like, the 400th floor or yes. something. Yes, And I went in there, and they said, uh, I said, why are you so high up? And the guy said, we have to be up high, otherwise people would kill us. <laughs> We're on the ground. We're on the ground floor. The last time I went to New York, I went to a taping of the Maury Povich show. I don't know if you're aware of Maury Povich. It's one of those horrible... Hor- it's like it's sub-Springer. So it's basically as a host. And I'm, I'm ashamed of what I did, and, I've, and I thought I could keep it quiet, OK? Um, it, so I'm in the audience, and it's um, parents who've got really badly behaved teenagers, like really bad, like the teenagers have tried to kill them, they smoke <laughs> crack, all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And these kids are like 14, 15 years old, 16 years old. And I'm in the audience, because everyone is, we were being encouraged to, I'm booing. I'm booing children with drug problems, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it was horrible. At the end, I, I went and saw one, and then we were invited to see another, and I went, actually, I feel really bad, I'm going to go. <laughs> At one point, I was shouting out, listen to your mama! <laughs> right. and at the, at the end I felt a bit dirty and I thought well that was and afterwards I had a real kind of confidence <laughs> crisis of confidence going was that the right thing to do morally was that except oh well at least no one will know about it then about six months later I had someone <laughs> tweeting me going I've just seen you in the audience of Maury Povich booing children I was like, I, and it's on all the time and loads of every now and then I'll get a tweet <laughs> saying hey you're a Maury Povich booing children it's horrible <laughs> listen, listen to your mama <laughs>
<laughs> so like a 14-year-old with a drug problem. That's awful. Sometimes they need to be told. Then at the end, right, Mori Povich <laughs> got them all back out, right, and they're all these kids being really stroppy. He said, right, teach your lesson. You're going to spend the night in prison. <laughs> he sent them to prison. And one of them fainted and had a panic attack. I like the sound of this, uh, this what's his name, Rory Movich. Rory Povich. Rory Povich. I like the sound of him. Tough talking. <laughs> they should lock more drug adult children up in prison. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> it's such a, I'm such a bad man. What's on your show this morning? Well, I've been very interested in your bus pass discussion. You've had some, some angry pensioners this morning. Very, Len, you? very angry. 78-year-old ex-soldier, blind. He's furious. Yes. Don't well, argue with them. No. Coming up at nine, we'll continue this discussion. I'll be asking, should the country save money and scrap the bus pass? As you've been discussing, there's a warning that continuing to fund the free bus pass will mean a 75% cut in spending on other transport services over the next ten years. Really? Yeah. The days are numbered, aren't they? Why are you laughing at? What's I've been that? sent a very naughty message by Catherine Boyle, our newsreader. Really? Who's a fan of Maury Povich. Really? Yes, she sent me a very rude message. I don't th- I'm working out whether I can read it. I don't think I can. No, don't. No. Um, so from nine this morning, I want to hear, if, if the writing is on the wall, yes. that the days of the bus pass are perhaps numbered, then is, should we just embrace it? Should we accept that the country needs to save money? The bus pass is a luxury we can no longer afford. Mm. Your views, 08459 four double five five double five. It's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people say, well, I've, yeah, but I've paid for it. Well, but, but cuts are being made everywhere. The argument that's being put up is um, MPs and their expenses. But that's all been sorted now, and MPs are only making legitimate expense claims. The problem is, there's, you've got pensioners who really need it, yep. but then you've also got really wealthy pensioners. There are loads... Of, have you ever been in Marks and Spencer's oh, food hall? Dear, yes. Who's in there doing the shopping? It's full of pensioners. Yeah. But yeah. I can't afford to do my weekly shop in Marks and Spencer. Relatives of mine, who are pensioners, they do their whole shop in Marks and Spencer, yeah. and they get a free bus pass. Yeah. So surely for people who don't need it... So your criteria is, if you're over 60 and you shop at least once a week in Marks and Spencer's, you shouldn't be allowed a bus pass. Possibly. From nine this morning, what do you think? Oh, eight, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. Have a nice time in New York. I will do. I'll, uh, I'll send you a postcard, I won't. No, you won't. No. I'm not even going to remember you once <laughs> I'm there. I'm going to be dancing around on Broadway. <laughs> That's in America, isn't it? Broadway. <laughs> yeah, I'll go now. It's a bit scary. Broadway! See you later. <laughs> now, oh, eight, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five is the phone number. On FM, AM and online, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's an interesting discussion that Jonathan's going to be having. We're being slightly flippant about it, but it is an interesting thing. What will happen to the bus passes? Now, this is a story we've been talking about all morning and Catherine's been covering in the news. And it's, uh, it's one of those stories you hear it. When it was mentioned to me yesterday, I was like, sorry, what? What happened? An investigation is underway after a woman with a history of heart attacks was turned away from Wickham Hospital while suffering palpitations. The nurse is told Becky Evans Woodward to go back into the car park and phone an ambulance because it was the only way she was going to be admitted. Earlier on, I spoke to the MP for Wickham, Steve Baker. He has raised this issue in the House of Commons. I understand an apology has been issued by the hospital. It's such an obviously appalling incident that... There has been an apology. Have you in, spoken in, to the hospital, Steve? Have they said anything to you? Um, I, I have spoken to uh, some of the staff. I'm going along to the hospital on Friday where I know we're going to have further conversations. I raised it in the House of Commons yesterday. Um, one member of staff did use the word outrageous privately, but I'm not going to name them. Mm. Um, but, you know, people do know that it's just not good enough to, turn this la- to have turned this lady away not once but twice. Um, and to have, for somebody to have been prepared to send her up to Stoke Mandeville to come back just because they couldn't perform an ECG, well, it's obviously just wrong. Well, joining us now is Alvin Evans Woodward. That's uh, Becky's husband. Morning, Alvin. Good morning. Can you talk us through what happened? What, what time of the day was this that this, this all took place? Um, just thought it was, well, it's 22 minutes past 8 o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, my wife, during the evening, had some palpitations. So we was like, right, take you straight to hospital. Cause she has a history of heart problems, doesn't she? Um, four years ago, in August uh, 2008, she had a major heart attack. Um, uh, 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 at what age? At 29. Wow. And then she had four subsequent ones all on the same day, so five heart attacks in one day. Um, we took her, to, well, she was in Stoke Mandeville. They took her over to the um, Harefield Hospital where she was treated, was on life support for five days. Wow. 
Um, so, so if, if anything kind of happens with, with her blood pressure or her heart, you, you are rightfully both kind of like, right, we're going to hospital, we're going to sort this out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, two years ago, um, it happened. She had this, this uh, episode, as we call it, where her heart raced up to 216 beats a minute. Um, she was taken to Wickham Hospital. They treated her within 15 minutes. She was all done and dusted. The staff there were brilliant. It was a very good service. Mm. Um, this time, it happened again. We was like, right, I'm going to rush you to hospital because that's where to go. It's Wickham is a cardiac hospital. So we get there, knock on the door. Nurse comes. She said, oh, you have to go over to the minor injury and illness unit to be referred by the GP. Um, I'm like, but, you know, my wife's having major palpitations. She needs to come into the hospital to the resus to have the medication to slow her heart rate. Oh, sorry, we don't do walk-ins. You have to go across the road and go through the policy and procedures. So I was like, okay, fine. So I went over the road to the GP-run department, crying out for a GP to come and help. He came out. He said, um, oh, I can't help you because we haven't got anyone here to do an ECG. But if you go over to Stoke Mandeville Hospital, drive to Stoke Mandeville Hospital, which is 20-minute drive, get an ECG done, they will then refer you back to High Wycombe and you'll be seen. So I was getting quite angry and annoyed. So I said to him, right, fine, if you can't help me, I'm going back over the road. So I went back over the road, knocked on the door. The nurse came. She's like, look, I can't let you in because you're not in an ambulance and you've not been referred by the GP. My wife at this stage is getting very upset. Um, I'm, I'm sure this isn't helping her palpitations in the slightest, is it? No, no I mean, she was, she was crying and she was starting to feel really ill. And she turned around and she said, how the hell do I get into this hospital? And the nurse said, if you step outside the accident emergency ambulance entrance door and phone an ambulance, they will send an ambulance and you can come in. So we, phoned, we stepped outside the door, we phoned an ambulance. The ambulance arrived seven minutes later. They started assessing my wife outside. Um, weren't able to do the full check, so we got access to the hospital we stood seven foot away from the resus door and the ambulance staff had to do an ECG on my wife in the corridor with her chest all open behind a movable screen for half an hour because the hospital wouldn't take her for the half an hour that the ambulance staff were there who were saying to them, she needs resus, she needs to be in the resus room, she's got a heart rate of 188 beats a minute. Um, and then when they put us in the room, into recess, um, she was sat on the bed for an hour and a half with no proper medication. All they'd done was took a couple of blood samples and said, oh, we're going to do some tests. And they left, it, left my wife for an hour and a half on a bed with a heart rate of 188 beats a minute. And I spoke to the cardiologist um, from Wickham last Wednesday, and I said to him, if I'd have presented my wife to you personally... Would you have left her on a bed for an hour and a half? And he said, no, your wife would have been treated within ten minutes and she would have been out of there in half an hour. Alvin, listen, this, this story is just, I find it incredible. We're running out of time, so I need to move on over to slightly. How, how has this left you feeling? Well, I mean, my wife is scared um, to the degree that she doesn't want to go to that hospital mm. because she's, she's afraid that, you know, she's going to become a statistic because somebody's going to die if they don't change their policies. And she doesn't want to be that statistic of the person that dies because of some bureaucratic money man. The MP's involved, you've got your MP involved, and the hospital is investigating what happened. What would you like to see done? I, I want to see that Wickham Hospital has an A&E department that is fit for purpose. You know, I mean, they say it's a Wickham is a cardiac hospital, so people with cardiac problems and strokes should go to that hospital. And if you can't be accepted into that hospital because you've not been referred by a GP or you're not in an ambulance, that's ridiculous. You know, I mean, if I'd have called an ambulance that night, it would have taken them 25 minutes to get to me. It took me 12 minutes to get to the hospital. Mm. I was at that hospital and I had to wait another, like, 13 minutes of running across to the minor injuries and illness unit and back over and phoning an ambulance to get help. Alvin, how is, how is Becky now? Is she all right? She, she's recovering. I mean, it, yeah. it knocked her for six. I mean, yeah. it does. I mean, 188 beats a minute for two and a half hours. Um, it's like running a marathon, four marathons. Um, and she was very tired and lethargic. Um, and it did. It made her feel like she'd been hit by a bus. Um, but, she, you know, she's getting, she's getting there. She, uh, her, her strength's coming back and her tiredness is going. Yeah. Um, but Harefield Hospital have been brilliant. They've, 
they, we, we saw the cardiologist that we were under. We went over and saw him, and he was like, right, OK, fine. And they, you know, they're running more tests on her. Well, Alvin, listen, we know that Steve Baker is uh, the MP's meeting with the hospital on Friday. Can we keep in touch with you and just, and just keep an eye on this? Because I think this is, this is an important story that I know a lot of people are interested in. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. All right, I mean, Alvin. I've, I've got an official complaint with them, and okay. I'm not going to hear till about the 20th of December. Um, you know, because of their policy and procedures on investigations. <laughs> OK, Alvin, listen, thank you very much. That's Alvin uh, Evans-Woodward, Becky's husband. We've got a statement. Wickham Hospital was unable to put anyone up to talk to us on the show, but they've sent us this. We can confirm we received a complaint from a patient about the services at Wickham Hospital and are currently jointly investigating. We would like an opportunity to meet the patient and discuss what happened in person. We seek to learn from our mistakes, making improvements to our services where necessary. <laughs> Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Coming up, I'll be speaking to former MP for Watford, Claire Ward. She had her phone hacked. I'll be finding out what she thinks should happen as a result of the Leveson inquiry. And many of you want to have your say on where the bus passes should be scrapped for elderly people. If you want to get in touch, 81333, starting your text 3CR, or give us a call. 08459 455 555. Big sports news this morning. Sebastian Vettel from the Milton Keynes-based Red Bull team could... And I stress could be stripped of his third world championship title. Ferrari are evaluating footage that appears to show Sebastian Vettel making an illegal overtaking move in Sunday's Brazilian Grand Prix. If there's enough evidence, they want to lodge a protest. Well, uh, John Watson is a Formula One pundit. He used to drive for McLaren. Morning, John. Good morning, Ian. What's, <clears throat> w- what's an illegal overtaking move? In the case of this incident, which we've seen on YouTube, There was a yellow flag area on the racetrack due to an incident, and the incident was being cleared away, which I think involved Sebastian Vettel in the first place. Coming down the back straight out of turn three down to turn four, there are flashing yellow lights, which mean you're not allowed to overtake another car in that zone. What appears to occur is, uh, as Vettel passes the last flashing yellow light, but before he gets to the flashing green light, which means it is safe to overtake, he overtook jean Eric Verne's Toro Rosso, which is in fact a sister car to the, to, to the Red Bull. And that would be seen to be an illegal manoeuvre uh, via the sporting code. Why are Ferrari evaluating the footage? Why didn't they make a complaint uh, at the Grand Prix itself? I think the evidence that has now become available via YouTube um, wasn't available to the teams. Ordinarily, if an offence is committed, uh, the the race director uh, and the the stewards of the meeting will convene and uh, a penalty will be announced. Ordinarily, what would happen would be, for example, I was there broadcasting for Radio 5 Live. On some of our monitors, we would get uh, uh, car number one investigation for overtaking under a yellow flag. Now, to my recollection, we didn't receive that. Uh, it does not to say that the evidence or the information was not seen by either the race director or and the stewards, but it appears that no action was taken, albeit there was a mention of a, an illegal overtake at some point during the Grand Prix or post the Grand Prix. I'm not entirely clear when it was. John, is this sour grapes on the part of Ferrari? No, it's, just not. Bitter. it's it's. It, I mean, it, it, it could be seen as being sour grapes, but we're talking about... The, the the sort of the op the, well, if you like the the governance of motor racing and uh, its rules and regulations. Ferrari have not yet lodged a protest. They've got until basically the end of the 30th of November, which is tomorrow, to do so. But the the FIA, the governing body of motorsport, doesn't need. It says that just I've got some of the code here. However, the governing body does not need Ferrari to act to investigate further. In fact, its own rules appear to oblige it to do so. It's, it's legalese, it's complicated. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> John, what happens? has to be investigated because the onboard cameras from Vettel's car, there are other camera angles that were not available or are not available to the viewer at home. And I suspect that the stewards of, this, of the race meeting will have to reconvene and, and, and look at this issue. John, what happens if it's upheld and it's found out that Vettel did overtake illegally? What, what, what does that mean for the well, outcome? the penalty would be, in the race, he would have had a drive-through penalty, but because the race is now a, a, a result, 
the the penalty would be a 20 second time uh, addition to his race distance and that would drop him from sixth I think down to eighth place and therefore t- he would then lose the world championship because he had to with, with Alonso finish second he had to finish sixth or higher to be comfortable of the world championship so it would mean the world championship would actually pa- pass over Ooh. from Vettel to Fernando Alonso and Ferrari I see. So but it's, it's, it's not by any means certain that this is going to happen because it's a question of whether the FIA or, the, or Ferrari choose to take it further John listen thank you very much indeed John Watson Formula One pundit we shall follow that story very closely this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio Ah, 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. It's been a busy day today. We've got still got plenty to cram in in the last 20 minutes. Bus passes, free bus passes. Have you got one? I know a lot of our listeners do. How often do you use yours? And do you, do you really need it? It's being called a financial time bomb by Urban Transport Authority buses. They say the scheme could lead to a 75% spending cut on other transport services. Well, our transport correspondent, Justin Dealey, is in Milton Keynes, finding out whether you think bus passes should be scrapped for the elderly. Justin, where exactly are you? Well, just outside the train station. Um, lots of buses going here as well this morning. Always such a, a big talking point, this one. Lots of opinions. A few moments ago, I spoke to Linda. Well, Linda, you've got some very strong views about this, straight to the point from yourself. Do you think the government should be spending money on handing out free bus passes? Yes, I should. The people who need the free bus passes need them for a reason. Mm. They can't afford it otherwise. To get places, they haven't got cars, that's the only form of transport. We spoke to somebody earlier on. In actual fact, a lot of pensioners are well off, they've got lots of property, they've got lots of money. Do you think that's a load of absolute rubbish? Well, those people should be means tested. Why can't a bus pass be means tested? Ah, right, OK. Why can't it be for people who are vulnerable? I've spoken to a lot of people on the buses, old ladies, who, when it first happened with, in Milton Keynes, when they first decided um, to bring um, stop buses for over 65, so you had to go um, after 9 o'clock in the morning... They were so upset because they couldn't get to the bank on time. They wanted to get to the bank. They wanted to get to places, and the bus was the only way they could get it. So it's interesting what you're saying. You're saying that people that are well-off, that are wealthy, don't deserve a free bus pass, but those with no money, they should certainly get them. Yes. They need it. How else are they going to get to places? Must they rely on lifts? Must they rely... How else are they going to do it? So the views there of Linda Ian, I mentioned this earlier, well, I'm struggling to find anybody who thinks that, that bus passes should be taken away from pensioners. That was close there with means testing. Joining me live here in our radio car is Cathy Westlake. Cathy, welcome to the programme. What's your views on this? Should the government continue to hand out free bus passes? Yes, I think they should. I think when people have worked hard all their lives, it's nice for them to have some extra support when they've retired. Um, I think that... Um, A lot of older people, sometimes they can't still afford to have a car. Um, Perhaps they never had a car. Sometimes they can't drive anymore because through um, becoming disabled. um, And uh, for the chance then to be able to get about on buses and go to places that they haven't been to before, perhaps... It keeps cars off the road. It, I think it keeps this sort of all-win situation. It's been described, though, as a financial time bomb. The money's running out, though, isn't it? Um, I don't know, because I don't keep the government's budget. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm sure that um, money could be fined. It's a matter of priorities rather than money. So it's an absolute no-no as far as you're concerned, like everybody else this morning, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree with everything. Just lastly, means testing. Um, somebody mentioned that briefly there. That was Linda in the last clip. She was saying, well, if we have got wealthy pensioners out there, they should be means tested because they're given a free bus pass. They're probably using it and they've got the money to pay for a bus pass anyway. So should there be means testing? One of the problems with means testing is, first of all, it adds more bureaucracy and a lot of administration, so it's costly, apart from anything else. Um, And also, there are always people that fall just one side of the line, and it's really difficult to say, where is that line? And if somebody earns, I know, £10 a year more than somebody else, does that earn their pension, does that mean that they don't get a bus pass? Oh, you are good. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Cathy, thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. There you go. Cathy Westlake joining us live on Three Counties Radio as well. So, Ian, you've heard some of the views this morning. People not happy at all.
at all. And it's every few months that this comes up. People again talking about it, potential means testing, is the money running out? But um, the majority of people again that I've spoken to this morning, and it's the same every time we do this story, all say that people deserve a free bus pass because they've paid into the system all of their life and they deserve it. It's a little treat. It's a little payback for them, let's say. Justin, we can't, af- we can't afford little treats, these are. Listen, say there, Justin, we've got Margaret in Zindansk. Well, morning, Margaret. Oh, good morning. You've heard that Justin and uh, the, the, his guest you were speaking to there. What, what, what do you think? Well, before the free pass pass came in, we used to have to pay 50p wherever we went yep. with our bus pass, which I thought was quite fair. Uh, whether we went to Luton or Hitchin or anywhere local like that. And um, surely if we could just pay 50p towards it, that might help. It would be contributing something. Would you feel, and would you feel happy paying that 50 pence? Uh, yes, Jenny I Margaret? personally would. I think, um, you know, I'd feel I was helping out. Um, I mean, I know it's, it is difficult because there's a lot of people who are really uh, struggling. And, uh, but, I mean, if it was 50p or perhaps 70p, you know, mm. it would all help towards, um, if every pensioner paid 50p or 70p, wherever they went, it would help. Margaret, uh, Margaret, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, Jonathan Werner-Smith, JVS himself, is going to be continuing the discussion on his big phone in from nine. He's asking, should the country save money and scrap the bus pass? If you want to get in touch with me... You've got 15 minutes, you can give us a call, 08459 455 555. If you want to book your place on Jonathan's show, I suggest you send him an email or wait until nine. Send him an email now, jvsshow at bbc.co.uk. Well, after around 100 days of hearings, hundreds of witnesses and thousands of pages of evidence, the Leveson Inquiry will report later today. It's been looking into the culture, practice and ethics of the press, and particularly how the industry should be regulated. Among the controversial issues it's looked at are phone hacking and the close relations between the press, senior politicians and the police. Whatever the conclusions, it's clear the report is going to have huge implications for journalists. Claire Ward is the former Labour MP for Watford and she had her phone hacked. She's going to be attending the inquiry today. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. What do you hope that Leveson, that the Leveson inquiry is going to recommend? Well, obviously, um, I have a lot of confidence in Lord Justice Leveson. I think that he conducted the inquiry very well. Um, and he appeared uh, to understand um, the concerns of lots of the victims. I think the first point, though, to say is that uh, certainly from my perspective, and I think many of the other people who um, have had their phone hacked, we are not looking um, to gag the press. We're not looking to remove any sense of the freedom of the press Um, to deal with important stories. But there has to be some form of responsibility and there has to be some morality in what they do. And the cases and examples that we've seen over several years but particularly come to light as a result of um, uh, the the Downer family um, are quite shocking. And we cannot have uh, the media in this country behave in that way without some form of... Um, ability of the victims to get justice. So I hope that Lord Justice Leveson brings forward uh, a theme that isn't about self-regulation because that has so clearly failed in this country Um, but is something that will require, that will be independent um, but will require those who are uh, publishers and media to take part in it because it's no good if they can turn around and say we don't want to be part of it. One of the, the arguments against that, though, is that it, it would stifle the freedom of the press. I don't accept that. Um, I think that freedom of speech is the most important, of course, but it has to come with responsibility, and we see none by the media. Um, and even as a result of uh, the Leveson inquiry, they still continued with some of the outrageous things that they've been doing. And if they can't see that after these years, this idea of the last chance saloon, this is a bar that should have been closed years ago. And frankly, we need to protect people as well as protecting freedom of speech. Dominic Mohan, the editor of The Sun, uh, kind of wrote a public letter a couple of days ago uh, pleading to be uh, given one more chance to to, to self-regulate. What would you say to that? I'd say he's had his chance. Um, He's had it more than once. Uh, He's had it over several years. And, you know, they're the sort of newspapers 
who would come down like a ton of bricks on other people and other institutions who said, please, can we have one more chance? If MPs had said, can we have one more chance? Quite rightly, they would have said no. If uh, NHS institutions like Staffordshire were getting it wrong and they said, please, can we have one more chance to do it ourselves? They would say no. And I think the media have got to understand that confidence has gone. Uh, the public want to see some form of independent regulation. All the polls show that that's what the public wants. And it's certainly what the victims want. So I know you can't go into too many details, but, but how did you find out your phone had been hacked? Um, I, I knew there were several things that had gone on in the past that um, had made me rather suspicious about things, um, including telephone calls from the media at the time. Um, and uh, as a result of that, in the summer of 2011, the police were in touch to tell me that um, uh, the, uh, uh, my name had appeared on the uh, list. How did that make of, you feel? Um, sick, <laughs> to yeah. be quite honest. Absolutely sick. And I think, you know, this isn't about celebrities or politicians. It's about the what we now know to be hundreds and possibly into the thousands of people who've been affected in one way or another by this sort of behaviour. And we're all entitled to a personal life, um, no matter who you are. And you're entitled to be protected from people who are breaking the law in doing the things that they did. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think there are examples that we've heard about, whether that be the McCanns, the Downer family, the Watsons, Chris Jeffries, whose whole lives um, have been turned around because of something that has happened. And that's, uh, you know, th those awful things have been made worse by the way in which the media has behaved. Claire Ward, thank you very much indeed for that. Caroline Keane is a media defence lawyer working on a number of high-profile cases for newspapers and magazines. Morning, Caroline. Hello. Uh, Claire's phone was hacked. Self-regulation didn't stop that. So it's, it's, it's got to be time for outside regulation, hasn't it? No, not at all. There is an, a, a multitude of regulation already governing the press. You know, hacking, nobody's defending hacking, obviously it was wrong, but it's already illegal. Putting in a new layer of regulation won't make one jot of difference. What you need is people to have upheld the laws that were already in place. You'll be getting a copy of the report, I think it's about 1.30 or That's something right. like that. What are you going to be looking for in it? Uh, I'm going to be looking at, obviously, the recommendations. I mean, clearly, the system can be improved, there is no doubt about that, but... It is very, very easy for people to say, oh, let's just add a touch of statute. Let's add a regulator. The laws are already there. Adding another layer of law or regulation won't make a jot of difference. You know, passing the Theft Act didn't stop people stealing. What you've got to do is implement the laws that are already there, not make it more complicated. I mean, here I am, a lawyer. You put in another level of statute, me and all my type, it's another open day for us to argue about what should or shouldn't be published, and that's not healthy. Is there ever a defence for, for phone hacking and that kind of level of, of invasion of privacy by the press? Uh, technically, there isn't. It's an absolute bar. Mm. Um, you do find that there have been, during the course of the last year or so, one or two newspapers who've admitted to phone hacking but claimed that what they did was in the public interest because it exposed some sort of genuine wrongdoing. And there's an argument, but technically the statute that says it's illegal doesn't allow you that defence. Caroline, very quickly, uh, my phone was hacked years ago. I've got no evidence. Can I get any money for it? Well, you could certainly try. Ooh. How much could I be in line for? Probably not an awful lot, actually. Oh, in that case, pro probably not worth the efforts. Probably not. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Caroline Keane, uh, media defence lawyer. Oh, I was disappointed there. I thought I could be up for a few grand. Oh, well, we'll let it pass. Uh, bus passes. Jonathan's going to be talking about this after nine. Bus passes. Maybe we should get rid of all free bus passes for the elderly and disabled people to uh, just save us a few quid. It's a financial time bomb. Jane's in Milton Keynes. Good morning, Jane. Morning. What do you think about this? I wouldn't mind paying. We used to pay in Milton Keynes. We used to put £10 on to top up the card and give it to the, give the card to the driver. Oh. And he took a, I think it was 30 pence at that time, yeah. fee for the bus off it. You know, it wouldn't bother me at all. So you wouldn't mind paying a little bit? No, not at all. Towards Because we've had some people who phoned no. up and are very angry about this, saying, no, you can't take this away. We've no, paid no. into this all our lives. It's our right. No, I, well, I don't believe it's a right. I mean, you know, 
it's very nice. It's, mm. a, it's a perk, really, isn't it? Yeah. So you'll, you'd be happy to contribute a little bit? Not at, yeah, not Jane, at all. Jane, sorry to go off on a slight tangent. We've, uh, uh, this morning, I don't know if you've heard, we've been talking about erotic fiction. Oh, right. Okay. Fifty Shades of Grey. Have you read that? Somebody's lent it to me. Oh. I thought I might get into it over Christmas. I don't know. Mm, OK. Well, can, can, can I just play you a little <laughs> clip? This is our, Just stay there, Jane. This is, this is our political uh, correspondent, Paul Scoynes, reading some of it. I'm just, just keen to get your, your thoughts on if this works for you. The surge of jealousy I felt only moments ago tells me that I have deeper feelings for him than I had admitted to myself. Wednesday, he confirms, and he leans forward and kisses me softly. Something changes while he's kissing me. His lips grow more urgent against mine. His hand moves up from my chin, and he's holding the side of my head, his other hand on the other side. Jane, <laughs> oh, oh deep you're deep laughing. That wasn't the reaction I was expecting. <laughs> it was his voice. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a silly voice, isn't he? It's not very romantic, is it? Oh, did you not think it was it was masterful and, and no, powerful? And... I think Nick Coffer could do it better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jane, well, on that bombshell, we'll leave it there. Thank you. I think Paul Scoyne's our political reporter. He did it. He wasn't happy to do it, but I think over the morning he's kind of enjoyed this role as as as. Heads, hearts and bucks, very own Mr Grey. But then to be told that maybe Nick Coffer could do it better. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Oh, that was fun. Paul Scoynes is very upset by Jane's comments there. He just tweeted, I am totally suing Jane. Oh, dear. JBS is up next. See you later. Ta-ta. Getting beds, hearts and bucks talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian.